Well, good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So uh, with that, we uh, were meeting in committee of the whole closed meeting. We did discuss a couple of items. Uh, one with respect to the Portsmouth Pumping Station uh, redirect and trunk water main, uh, and then also an organizational update, the CAO performance review, and a senior staff contract renewal. Uh, so with that, I will ask the uh, acting clerk uh, for a motion to waive our procedural rules and have the chair report. Moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, seconded by Council McLaren, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting that the rules of bylaw number 2021-41 be waived and the Mayor report. Okay, if I can just get that um, on my screen. Yes. So first we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay. Uh, so here we have a motion uh, moving out of committee the whole closed meeting, moved by Councillor Tanani, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the city enter into a new employment agreement with Chief Administrative Officer Lanny Hurdle for a term beginning December 4th, 2023, on the terms and conditions recommended in closed session on May 2nd, 2023, and that the mayor and city clerk be authorized to sign that employment agreement in a form satisfactory to the Director of Legal Services. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, CEO Hurdle, on behalf of Council, I want to say what a pleasure it's been working with you over these last few years, and we look forward to another great four years ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we'll move on in our agenda to the approval of the adids. We have two sets of adids, uh, both in reference to a number of delegations, and then there are some. There is an additional information report number three, and then some communications. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the adids, please? Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Stephen. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, these have been duly submitted already. I, Ryan Bowman, with the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Motion 1. I declare an interest with respect to new Motion 1 insofar as this relates to utilities Kingston. And I, Ryan Bowman, with the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of closed meeting agenda item 4 insofar as this relates to utilities Kingston. Thank you. Okay, are there any other declarations of pecuniary interest? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will move on. We have no presentations this evening, but we do have a number of delegations. Uh, so first, I will invite Karen Cross, Chief Executive Officer of the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce, Megan Howes, Events and Management Plus Incorporated, and Brent Neely, Co-Owner and Sales of Marketing Manager DigiGraphics, to appear before Council to speak to Clause 4 of Report Number 42 from the CAO with respect to the Conference Center update and next steps. Uh, just a note to all of our delegations this evening that you have up to five minutes to speak, uh, and then we will move to questions from members of Council. Ms. Cross, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honour. Good evening, I'm Karen Cross, CEO of the Greater Kingston Chamber of Commerce. I'm here on behalf of our Board of Directors and 650 members. Joining me tonight are our members Brent Neely of DigiGraphics and Megan Howes of Events and Management Plus Inc. As the Chamber's mission states, we are committed to stimulating the growth and prosperity of local business community, of our local business community. That said, the development of a multi-purpose convention center in our downtown core meets that mission. Given the increasing interest in Kingston as a large conference destination, we have a significant opportunity to increase our overall economic impact for the entire city. We urge Council to allow this opportunity to begin to the process towards creating this important resource. I now turn the time to Brent Neely of DigiGraphics. 
Good evening, I'm Brent Neely. I'm the co-owner and sales and marketing manager of Digigraphics. Uh, we are a local business specializing in printing, design, and mailing, and we've been doing so in Kingston for more than 30 years. Um, we're very excited about the prospect of a conference center for all Kingstonians and the businesses that will be positively impacted. Keeping business production here and supporting local is key. More conferences with larger attendances will give businesses like ours um, the chance to increase our output, meaning more exposure, increased work, and added jobs. As a printing company, we have the capacity to support all aspects of event planning and the expertise to welcome this opportunity. We also welcome the possibility to work with other local suppliers as well to increase the purchasing of goods and services pertaining to larger events. Moreover, post-event, we can also build relationships for ongoing work beyond a single conference. We encourage you to vote yes on this game-changing initiative. Good evening. My name is Megan Howes, and I'm an executive manager at Events and Management Plus here in Kingston. Our company was founded in Kingston, and for over 30 years, we have been managing national, international, and regional events, conferences, and trade shows from our Kingston office. We currently employ between 20 and 25 local staff. We believe that a conference center in Kingston would be beneficial to the city and its residents and businesses in many ways, providing expanded opportunities to bring events into the city that we currently must direct to other cities. Adding large-scale events would boost our local economy, including using experts in a using, excuse me, using experts in event planning, strategy, design, as well as printers, signage, promotional product agencies, and show companies. Several of our clients have wanted to host their events in Kingston. One of them hosts an annual event in Eastern Ontario, and the catchment area is, for the attendees is between Port Hope and Cornwall. But we have had to move the conference to Ottawa because there are no facilities big enough in Eastern Ontario to accommodate a large-scale event. We believe a conference centre in Kingston would provide the opportunity to host these larger events and, and allow professional conference organizers and experts like us to promote Kingston as a national conference destination. We support this important initiative. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our second delegation. We'll invite Krista LeClaire, Executive Director of Kingston Accommodation Partners, and Brian Hope, Regional Director of Sales for Diamond Hotels, to appear before Council to speak to, again, Clause 4, Report Number 42, from the CAO with respect to the Conference Centre update. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and members of Council. My name is Krista LeClaire, and I'm the Executive Director for Kingston Accommodation Partners. And this is one of our members, Brian Hope, Regional Director of Sales for Diamond Hotels, which includes the Delta, Holiday and Express Kingston, Quality Inn and Conference Center, Kingston Central, and Comfort Suites Kingston Central. We are here to show our support for the Conference Center report appearing before you tonight. CAP, on behalf of its board of directors and almost 50 member businesses, is in support of a conference center space at the proposed site in downtown Kingston, and we want to thank city staff for the work put into the staff report and for their collaboration. We look forward to having further conversations with city staff about this project. The request before you tonight is that Kingston approves the next step, or, sorry, Council approves the next step of this project, which would be to go to RFI to gather more information on the feasibility of this project. We are here to reiterate the value a space like this would create for Kingston and the impact it would have on businesses. In 2021, the Floor 13 study showed lost business reporting of over 11,000 room nights, a, a loss of over 11,000 room nights. And we'd like to stress that these actuals are much higher due to meeting planners that are currently, uh, that do, currently do not consider Kingston because we don't have the space to accommodate their needs. A conference space would add to the scale and marketability of the destination and meet the needs of planners who are looking to host around 1,000 delegates. As well, the conference center will create new market potentials for the destination in attracting more and larger meetings, conferences, and events, which will benefit the industry and business community through increased visitor volumes and spending. It is also important to highlight that the business event segment generally prefers spring and fall as its high demand seasons. 
um, therefore impacting shoulder season dates rather than Kingston's summer high season. In addition, conferences are most often during the week, which is when most of our members see less visitors. And it's widely accepted that business travelers spend up to four times more than leisure guests. The project su supports all of these items, increasing traffic during shoulder months, midweek, and staying longer. In addition, it's important to note that many hospitality workers are seasonal, and a project like this would support increased business in the shoulder season, which would support increased hours for workers and job security. Finally, all of our members across the city would benefit from the pro a project like this due to incremental business. We know that when downtown is busy, the properties outside of downtown benefits. Now I'd like to hand it over to Brian to speak about his on the ground experience. Hello everybody. Um, I have had the absolute pleasure to attend numerous trade shows and events with uh, the fabulous crew at Tourism Kingston. And so when we're at uh, tete a -tete or CSAE, these are large conferences where we try and lure prospective clients into our beautiful city, uh, we hear the same thing over and over again from, uh, from that they're like, love Kingston, love Kingston, you don't have a conference center. We're like, all right, thanks a lot, buddy. Uh, you know, and they take a chocolate and they move on. So uh, we'd love to you know, show these people uh, our beautiful city. And we do get, like when we go to these events, we do get the smaller conferences, but there we could get large conferences to this city, no problem. People are looking for a different place to meet than the Shaw Center in Ottawa or the MTCC, right? So uh, there is so many, uh, there's so many benefits to having a conference center here. Uh, and these trade shows that I go to are all like the CSA National Conference is in November, Tete a Tete is in January or February. I've got another one here, a CSAE Winter Summit. Guess what, that's in the winter. Um, they also have a summer summit, just so you know, in 2024, and uh, Tourism Kingston was lucky enough to, well, not lucky enough, savvy enough to land them, so they're coming here, and that's going to be a whole bunch of prospective meeting planners that we have here that book these national conferences, and we can show them the little area where our conference center will be. People are excited. We talk about the potential of it when we go to these trade shows. So it's we're super excited for it, and we hope everybody else is too. Uh, speaking about seasonal workers, uh, we do have uh, like uh, there are, we've got numerous seasonal workers that are here, such as uh, like the Aquaterra patio, grand opening May 18th. Um, so and that is center where they can move into. That is perfect because they're working on the off season. Um, as well, I'm just going to see if we have, uh, oh, okay, one more thing. That's why I wrote things 30 down. seconds. Perfect. I only have 15. Um, so if this doesn't just help downtown. If downtown fills up, that will help out our properties, the Comfort Suites, Quality and Holiday and Express at our uptown properties because that travelers that are coming in not part of the conference will book there. And, uh, and it'll just make the whole city busy. Uh, we travel everywhere. Like when we go to restaurants and things like that, we're in trade shows, and it is fabulous. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do have some questions. Um, where you quoted um, that there's been the loss of, I think, 11,000 hotel rooms. Um, like, what type of conferences do you think could have come to Kingston that instead went to Ottawa? And do you see, is it Ottawa that's our main competitor? Um, so... For the 11,000, I mean, and there's definitely more than that, um, I would say that uh, conferences such as, uh, I would say, CSTA to start, which is like the Sports Tourism Association uh, that travels all across. So uh, they'll do, they're in, I think, Richmond, BC this year. Uh, th these are events that we would be able to grab. So they're large scale events, like we're talking about like eight or 900 people. Uh, the Rendezvous Conference would be like right around there as well. That's a tour and travel conference that we go to every year. Uh, where it's in Quebec City this year. Uh, it was in Calgary, uh, I think last, or Toronto last year, and Calgary a couple years beforehand. Uh, these conferences here uh, are, uh, like, there are tons of them uh, that uh, would be able to come in this way. I, I can pull out more exact ones if you like. But. No, thank you. And through you, just reiterating that the 11,000, those were 
ass of space in Kingston in which we didn't, we weren't able to host, but there are so many potential um, associations, medical conferences, these types of groups that don't come here, don't even look at Kingston because they know that we can't host them. So that's just a very small snippet. Um, and also my colleague that will be coming to do delegation has um, more information on further lost business as well for you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you both very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our third delegation. I will invite Mary Jo Curier, Executive Director of the Downtown Kingston BIA, and Tim Pater will appear before Council to speak to Clause 4 of Report Number 42 from the CAO, again with respect to the Conference Centre. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, Councillors. Um, you have, you're going to review a lot of information about the Conference Centre from people that are much smarter than me, so I've kept mine fairly short and simple just to really bring home what a Conference Centre or the increase of pedestrian traffic could do for small business. This is a chart of pedestrian counts in the corner of King and Princess in downtown Kingston from April 2022 to April 2023. Our business experiences a 61% decrease in general in pedestrian counts from July as compared to January. An average day in July saw approximately 36.83 pedestrians, while an average day in January averages drop to 14.73. This past March, which is in the shoulder season, counts were at 18.59 per day, 50% lower than in comparison to July. Sometimes it's hard to relate to numbers on a chart to help fully grasp the impacts of heightened pedestrian counts on small businesses. Here's a simple illustration comparing January and July monthly pedestrian counts that I just showed you. Let's say out of the 1,425 or so people in downtown Kingston on a typical Saturday in January, a retailer might have six customers. Each customer spends $100, totaling $600 for the day, or $13,000 for the month, based on a five-day week. In July, that same business may see, see an average of 34 customers, let's say, in a day, each spending $100. Daily sales are $3,400. That's approximately $72,000 for the month, based on a five-day week. Big difference. By the way, we saw over 7,000 pedestrians this past, uh, at King and Princess this past um, Blues Festival, just to give you an idea of the value of, of event traffic. None of this is rocket science, what I'm telling you, but hopefully it helps to illustrate the effects on a, that a conference center could have on one small business. Downtown Kingston has had the highest density of business in the city, with over 700 small businesses downtown combined as one of the largest employers in the city. The decision to build a conference center that's going to, at the very minimum, increase pedestrian traffic in the downtown core in the shoulder season, which is really low-hanging fruit, is, seems like a, a simple decision. Just to bring it home a little bit more, I'm going to invite Tim Pater, who's online, who is the owner-operator of four of our most popular restaurants located in downtown Kingston, Black Dog Tavern, Atomica Kitchen, and Cocktails, Harper's Burger and Bar, and Diane's. Thanks, Mary Jo. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as, as Mary Jo mentioned, I'm Tim Pater, owner-operator of Black Dog Hospitality. Um, I've been in the, in the restaurant business for 23 years in downtown Kingston and have also worked in the industry uh, for many years prior to that. And the single big, biggest challenge that any of us have faced uh, for a span of 30 years is winter time in the restaurant business. So I'm going to speak a little more specifically to restaurants. Um, Mary Jo's illustration is, is very sort of um, factual. It, it really, uh, our industry really dies down in the wintertime. We could almost be qualified as seasonal businesses. Um, and with the, uh, with having gone through the pandemic, um, the uncertainty of restaurant jobs is, is high on people's mind. Uh, we had to lay off our staff uh, three times during that period. But even prior to the pandemic, winter has always, always been a challenge for us. Um, Often we sort of, uh, everything that we, all the steps we, we move forward are two steps back in the winter, in the summertime, sorry. Um, anyway, um, past the winter challenges, supporting restaurants is, is a very important uh, thing for our downtown economy. Uh, restaurants um, 
also help to keep tourism dollars within our local economy. Many restaurants are making an effort to buy local and support local producers, breweries, farmers. So th those dollars, instead of leaking out, um, stay within our economy. So having a healthy uh, hospitality industry and food and beverage industry, as well as retail and of course accommodations, um, filters through our, our whole community. Uh, many restaurants support local uh, charities and fundraisers. Um, and really, I think our industry is, we're lucky we have, we have um, several sort of anchor chain businesses, uh, restaurants in downtown Kingston, but a lot of many, a lot of our restaurants are local and independent and uh, have really become part of the fabric of our community. I think the- 30 the seconds. Conference, okay, the idea of a conference center is, is Mary Jo, uh, mentioned is a, is a simple one, at least to vote yes to move to the next steps. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, four additional delegations uh, that we would need to add to our agenda. So first, moved by Councillor Tozo, second by Councillor Shaves, that our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Ted Robinson from Tourism Kingston to speak to Council. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Uh, next, moved by Councillor Tozo, second by Councillor Shaves, that our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Peter Kingston from Speak Kingston to speak to Council. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Uh, next, moved by Councillor Tozo, second by Councillor Shaves, that our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Ara McCauley to speak to Council. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Uh, and then finally, moved by Councilor Tozo, seconded by Councilor Shaves, our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Nick Waterfield to speak to Council. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so with that, we will move to delegation number four. We'll invite Ted Robinson to speak to Council, again, with respect to report number 42 from the CAO with the Conference Centre update. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, councillors. My name is Ted Robinson. I'm the business event specialist at Tourism Kingston, and I spend much of my time working with corporate and association uh, event planners, uh, promoting Kingston as an ideal destination for meetings and conferences. Uh, all too often, my conversations with these people end with them saying that while they know our city and would love to bring their events here, they, they don't believe that we have the type of facility they need to ensure a successful gathering for their groups, which are often more than the 300 people that we can comfortably accommodate in our downtown meeting spaces. I highlight downtown because almost without exception, that is where conference organizers and attendees want to be. On the screen is a chart, sorry, on the screen is a chart showing some of the groups that have considered hosting in Kingston and have opted for other destinations because of our limitations. Many of the gatherings are 500 people or more, but many are not. Uh, it's not always the number of attendees driving the decision to go elsewhere. Often it's the sheer complexity of managing logistics when having to use multiple properties. Uh, consider, for example, a conference with 250 delegates requiring plenary session space for the entire group, five breakout spaces for 50 people each in concurrent sessions in morning and afternoon, plus separate space for breakfast and lunch, all on a tight and defined timeline. This is a typical conference framework that in Kingston requires using at least two and sometimes three different properties. Organizers don't object to housing delegates in different hotels when they're as close as ours are in downtown Kingston. But what is a deal breaker is delegates having to move, multiple, to move locations multiple times per day to get to the different meeting spaces they need. Because of this, we lose out regularly to destinations like Niagara Falls, Hamilton, London, Muskoka, and Kitchener-Waterloo, not to mention large centers like Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. And those are the meetings and conferences we know we've lost. I speak regularly with meeting planners for corporate and, uh, association and government bodies who never even consider Kingston because they know we haven't got what they need to support their events. Consider one sector where Kingston seems a natural to host some of its many conferences, medicine. Queen's University's Faculty of Health Sciences and its nine advanced academic programs are known across the country and around the world. Kingston Health Sciences Center conducts research in 21 key fields as it seeks to advance patient care and improve health outcomes. In short, Kingston plays a critical role in the world of healthcare and medical research. 
and yet of, more than, of the more than 100 notable medical conferences that will take place in Canada this year, Kingston could not pursue most because we don't have the type of purpose-built conference facility that these types of gatherings require. And that's just one key sector. Economically, meetings and conferences are big business in Canada. In 2017, Oxford Economics ranked Canada sixth in the world in direct impacts generated by business events. According to Destination Canada data from 2019, business events attracted 1.6 million delegates that year, directly employed over 25,000 people, and generated direct economic impact of $2.6 billion, or $1,625 per delegate. That's over five times the average direct impact, according to the numbers I see, uh, for a leisure traveler. To support the activity we know will attract when we have the right facility, hotel capacity will need to be enhanced. Currently, there are 740 hotel rooms within reasonable walking distance of the Block 4 property. That is not sufficient to support attendance at a conference center of the size proposed, as well as our existing tourism activity. For example, a 250-person conference combined with a sizable week-long film shoot and our existing leisure and sport tourism activity currently goes beyond our maximum capacity, and that's exactly what is going to happen in June of this year. Speaking of those other sectors, I know that my colleagues who focus on sport and wellness, film and music, each see tremendous opportunity with the addition of this facility. As one example, imagine this. Juno's Week in Kingston, with a full slate of shows and events in the conference center and at venues throughout the city, hotels bustling with musicians and music industry folk, all culminating in the Juno Awards ceremony at the Leon Center and opening with a tribute to the tragically hip. We can't do that now, but we will be able to when we have this conference center. 30 seconds. In short, Kingston has everything we need to play a, large role, a larger role in, in and derive full benefit from the business event sector in Canada, save one critical element. A purpose-built conference center designed with input from those who will use it, work in it, live around it, and promote it. A LEED certified facility incorporating all the best learnings of the pandemic, embracing all that is unique about Kingston, and designed as a truly iconic addition to our civic infrastructure, will open the city to a whole new world of possibilities in tourism, and to provide Kingstonians with a fitting place to gather for so many of their most important life occasions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robinson, for the um, presentation. Uh, could you just tell us what's considered, if you will, high season for conferences? Uh, primarily in spring and fall, uh, with some activity in the wintertime, depending okay. on the sector. And so how much impact do we actually expect during our shoulder seasons? Uh, I think it would be significant. I think it would go a long way to leveling out that hump that exists in our tourism sector, which is all focused in that June to September period. Okay. And just one more quick question. Unfortunately, it's a two-question limit during delegations, okay. Councillor Glenn. Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. That's excellent. Um, so you mentioned that we only have... Um, 740 hotel rooms within a, a, an acceptable walking distance and, and potentially 100 more with a, a, with a, a conference center or something like that. Where, where did, did you say that more, are, uh, more rooms downtown are contemplated? Or is that I, I, I can't really speak to that okay. specifically. Right. Yeah, I, I, all I can say is that with a thousand person conference center and 740 yeah. rooms existing, uh, we, 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 there is definitely room for oh, expansion. That's, what you said. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, with that, we'll move to our fifth delegation. We will invite uh, Peter Kingston from Speak Kingston <laughs> to uh, speak to council with respect to the conference center. I don't think you're Peter Kingston. <laughs> you have the floor, Wanda. Obviously, I'm not Peter Kingston. Um, Your Worship, Mayor Patterson, honorable members of council, my name is Wanda Williams and I'm the co-chair of K Speak Kingston. The purpose of my presentation this evening is to, on behalf of Speak Kingston and its members, to fully support the development of a downtown Kingston conference centre. <clears throat> this topic has been discussed for many years, in fact over a decade, but no decision has ever been made by past councils to advance it. The studies have been done, the experts consulted, the financial benefits to the economy are clear. Now it's time to grow business tourism. 
and we believe a conference centre will do just that. Many of us have had the opportunity to attend conference centres in London, Halifax, Victoria, Charlottetown. They are all located in their respective downtowns and contribute to the vibrancy and commerce of each city. Conferences and events bring new visitors to our city, people who will return to enjoy Kingston's many tourism treasures. For example, the Briar Curling Championship held in 2020 brought enormous financial benefit to Kingston's downtown core and put us on the map as a city that knows how to run large-scale events. A conference centre adds to an existing capacity that is often stretched during our busy tourist season. We've also become a hotspot as a filming location, which requires added resources, and with three academic institutions, a conference centre offers the opportunity to attract larger, prestigious academic conferences to benefit faculty, staff, members, students, and local organisations. I would like to highlight a couple key points that we think are critical to consider in favour of locating the city's first conference centre across from the Leon Centre. As we all know, lots of things we took for granted have turned upside down since the start of the pandemic. One of the biggest impacts that it has had is on people being able to work remotely. Many companies and governments are struggling with the new normal. However, it's clear that we are not going back to the way things were pre-pandemic. For downtown Kingston, this has meant significantly fewer people working downtown, whether they be employees at companies like Empire Life, who are selling their building and moving to a new location, the Ontario Ministry of Health, which has significant percentage of their staff now working remotely, or other businesses located in buildings like the Royal Block. All of, the, all of this adds up to less foot traffic during the day, which means less business for restaurants and retailers who have all enjoyed serving these workers for decades. We must continue to develop opportunities to attract people to the downtown core. On a more positive note, our city has been able to witness the significant impact the Leon Centre has had on foot, tra tra foot traffic downtown, particularly in the evenings and on weekends. The increased activity in our restaurants and bars have helped to revitalize downtown and our nightlife and has supported our retail industry. This venue continues to draw new and repeat consumers to this city. Think of the possibilities of investment. <clears throat> the, excuse me. Think of the possibilities for investment when a downtown conference center draws new business leaders and decision makers into our city. They will be able to see firsthand a vibrant and strong economic community in a busy, safe, and walkable downtown. Speak Kingston's main goal is to su support smart growth and a new conference centre hits all the marks. Not only does it meet with our organization's strategic tenets, but it also accomplishes the city's integrated destination strategy and the City of Kingston and Economic Development's integrated strategic plan, all approved by our city leaders. We urge Council not to allow this opportunity to pass by yet again and to instead begin the process towards creating this opportunity this community resource that will strengthen our city. This concludes my comments, Your Worship, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Williams, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to delegation number six. We'll invite Ara McCauley to speak to Council, uh, again, with respect to the Conference Centre update. Thank you, Mayor Patterson and Councillors. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the Artistic Director of Kingston Writers Fest. Kingston Writers Fest, for those of you who don't know, is an annual festival um, taking place over five days at the end of September. Um, we bring approximately 6,000 visitors um, and attendees to the festival every year. And uh, we are celebrating this year our 15th annual festival. I am particularly excited and um, in, uh, uh, agreement with the concept of a conference center. One of the challenges that we have a, as a festival is that, um, as is the case with many arts organizations, we are not-for-profit. Um, funding is limited. Um, and finding spaces, our hands are often tied. Um, with the number of events that we hold, there is currently only one location in downtown Kingston that can accommodate our needs. Um, and we are often competing with Queen's University for spaces, um, 
trying to add extra events to our festival this year, we found out that local downtown hotels had their event space booked by January. And this is for, for the end of September. Um, another issue for us is the issue of modularity. Um, most hotel uh, event spaces are max capacity of about 110 to 220 people. And then the next spaces that you're looking at are th something like the Kingston Grand Theater or the Isabel Bader Center, which seat uh, 466 to 700 plus. Um, and so trying to find that location that can host a, uh, an event of 300, 350, 400 individuals um, is something that has been a consistent challenge, um, not only for our organization, but for many other arts festivals um, and arts producers that I've spoken to. Um, the other issue for us is one of uh, expansion. Um, as funding has decreased, as people are recovering from the pandemic, as corporate support has gone down, the real opportunity for us is ticket sales. And when we have a, a capped capacity on how many tickets we can sell to each event, um, there's just a limit to how much we can grow that. We have a fantastic local um, core group of audience members who support us every year. And so the, the place for growth for us is out of town markets. It's bringing in people from other neighborhood communities, from bedroom communities, encouraging them to stay. Um, and another thing I'll say from a logistical point of view for us is that one of the central parts of our festival is the festival field trip, which has um, literally hundreds of high school students being bused in <laughs> to downtown Kingston to a hotel and being asked to go up the fire escapes so that they don't clog the um, elevators um, <laughs> to and from events, uh, creating chaos. I mean, there's certain amounts, uh, there, or on Thursday during the festival, there is a point where we have um, almost 1,500 people on site, and that is pushing the capacity for that festival. So I, I think for uh, the schools to have a location where they could park their buses, keep their buses there, um, know where their children are without chasing them down literally in fire escapes that might lead them out of the building. Um, I think that's an incredible benefit. And then just from a professional point of view, um, a streamlined process, an ease of access, accessibility, not having to rely on elevators to get people to and from events, um, to have a one-stop shop and not have people complaining about old infrastructure and loud air conditioning and the smell of chlorine from the pool interrupting them when they're doing a writer's workshop um, would just allow us to elevate our reputation um, and draw in better, uh, better names, bigger names, and just make the arts community here in Kingston look more professional. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Bohm? Thank you, Your Worship, and three. So if, if I'm understanding you correctly, an investment in a conference center downtown would essentially be an investment in the arts community as well. Absolutely, I, I think so. Um, we're very limited right now in terms of what our options are. Um, and that means, again, as everyone has been saying, turning down uh, an author that might bring 350 people because, um, we just we know we can't afford to to rent out the grand theater and have it looked empty and just pay you know paying the IOTC fees and everything like that. It's an absolutely beautiful building, but it's not in our capacity as a not for profit to to bring those events in. Whereas a conference center would allow us to do so. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other questions. Thank you, Ara. Uh, with that, we'll move to our seventh and final delegation. We will invite Nick Waterfield to appear before council again to speak to report number 42 from the CAO with respect to the conference center. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. I'm uh, the last delegation and I will keep it, keep it short because everything that I've heard has been extremely positive and I can only echo it. I'm sure you don't want to hear it again. I'm, uh, I am on the board of downtown Kingston, but I'm actually here as a restaurateur. I manage Shea Piggy Restaurant and I manage uh, Panchancho Bakery, both of which are relatively uh, solid institutions in downtown. And we very much support the concept of a conference center on the Block D property that you're asked to support tonight. The challenges of running a small business are 
pretty much unknown, I think, to an awful lot of people. We had uh, our latest downtown Kingston meeting, we had Karen Sanducci from the, the uh, Public Work Department talking about her staff of 120. We have 126 on staff right now, and that will only grow. So we might be a small business in your eyes, but we employ a lot of Kingstonians. Um, and we go through amazing swings. Uh, Tim Pater was here. I didn't realize he was presenting. I might have stayed home. Um, but the swings in our business are quite, quite severe. We're, we're easily twice as busy in our busy months as we are in our slow months. And through that all, we're trying to maintain the staff, give them quality of life, give them solid incomes, uh, steady incomes. And Conference Centre will just add to the revenue stream for that in a way that we currently see the Leon Centre has done. I was party of the debates of whether the Leon Centre slash K Rock slash LVEC should be built. It's a wonderful impact for our business. When we have an event there like last Wednesday, the financial impact is immediate. It's, and the Conference Centre will only do that for us in the same manner. Um, I don't really have much to offer beyond that except to say, as an individual business person in downtown, I very much support this and I hope that you give it the go-ahead tonight so we can get to the next stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Baum. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So as a business owner downtown, would you say that the conference center uh, is something that would help maintain into the future the vibrancy of downtown, which is something we're all basically well aware of is, you know, at a critical point right now after the pandemic? I would say yes, it will maintain it, and it won't detract from it in a negative way. Uh, the People, I don't go to conferences, but people do. They, they take advantage of the city and they, they take from the city in a pleasant way. Um, so I don't see any negatives coming from it. And the economic impact is what will help us maintain our, our vibrant downtown. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Seeing other questions, uh, thank you very much. Thank you much. Okay. So that takes us to the end of our delegations. So now we'll move on to briefings. We do have one briefing. Matthew Claus, Managing Director of HLT Advisory Inc., will brief Council on Clause 4, Report Number 42, received from the CAO with respect to the Conference Center update and next steps. And I see that Mr. Claus is online with us. Mr. Claus, welcome, and I will pass the floor over to you. Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, so I'll speak to our we're HLT advisor, we're an independent third-party boutique consulting firm that focuses particularly on the convention center industry. So if you mind going to the next slide, I'll speak to a little bit about the work we've done uh, for tourism Kingston, the city, in terms of looking at this, uh, this conference center and the feasibility of the conference center. So in, in terms of scope, um, sorry, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Uh, is, could you uh, flip to the next slide by chance? There we go, perfect. Um, so starting in the fall, we started working with Tourism Kingston and the city to look at the, the feasibility of a conference center. So really this scope we've carried out in markets across Canada, many similar to Kingston. Um, and it really involves summarizing industry-wide supply and demand trends, assessing Kingston as uh, the current Kingston market situation with respect to uh, the business events industry. I look at the competitive landscape, both obviously within Ontario and across Canada, and then HLT made a recommendation. The space program we think makes sense for the market, uh, projected the financial performance and the economic impact of the venue. So just to give you a little background and comfort level with, with HLT and who you're speaking to, um, HLT works for uh, conventioners of Canada annually benchmarking operations. So 21 of the purpose-built conventioners across Canada all share their operational data with us and we compare their operations so they can get an idea of how they're performing. Uh, we do the same thing with an association called AIPC internationally, which is 50 plus convention centers internationally that share their information with us. And then independently, we work for these venues and cities and provinces as well. So of those 21 in Canada, we worked for 11 just in the past year on, on, on different engagements. So we really, these numbers in terms of comparable performance are based on factual um, recent performance of all these venues. As part of our study, we reviewed the previous work done. Uh, HLT actually did a study back in 2013 uh, for KEDCO at the time, um, looking at the feasibility of a conference center and subsequent, I mean, I think Council and, and are, is aware of this, the 2031 and 413 work that's been referred to today. Um, we can look at the market as a third party, but it's always helpful for us when we're in a new city to speak to the folks that will be using the venue and, and what their perspectives are. So 
as part of this engagement, we directly interviewed 11 meeting planners with respect to Kingston and the potential for them hosting often many meetings that they, they host annually in the destination, the pros and cons associated with it. And we also spoke to 18 Kings, Kingston tourism stakeholders. And then finally, I want to quickly cover what the report spoke to and um, some of the key assumptions that were in the report. So based on advice from the city, we were approaching the conference center as being privately funded as part of a mixed use project. The other aspects of the mixed use project were not defined um, at this point, and, and they could range from residential to parking to hotels, which has been spoken to in retail. Um, and our study's focus was really on the conference center component. So as I walk through the numbers, just please keep in mind that this is us carving out the conference center operations. I'm happy to speak to potential synergies if, if the, the questions arise, but this is really looking at the conference center as a standalone project. If you could flip to the next slide, please. So there's a lot of folks that have spoke um, in related industries about the economic impact of these buildings. And candidly, from my experience, when these buildings are built, they're often built for that economic impact focus, often have significant government funding as a result. But there's examples that push towards profitability as well. So this spectrum that I'm showing on the screen now, I like to show because while each of these centers that I've highlighted, and we go into more detail in the report, are purpose-built convention centers, the degree to which they're focused on economic impact, i.e. bringing in out-of-town delegates that spend in the community versus profitability um, can vary pretty significantly. So the three I have on the screen here, these arrows are my arrows, HLT's arrows, not, not what those folks do, but we work with all these venues directly. Um, the Fredericton Convention Center actually has right in their mandate that they won't take a piece of business that can go into a local hotel. And as a result, they're subsidized pretty significantly annually, a $950,000 operating grant. So I put them far towards the economic impact focus. Um, RBC Place London operates closer to break even. Um, they do have ancillary revenue items like the parking. Um, and they still have an economic impact mandate, but they infill a lot of those periods with local banquet groups. Similar to Kingston, they're a bit of an education city, so a lot of Western grads and so on are running through the ballrooms at RBC Place London. And then finally, the Hamilton Convention Center was publicly owned and publicly run, um, was privatized back in 2013. A local banquet company named Carmen's Group took over operation and now runs with much more of a profitability focus. And the implications of that are Tourism Hamilton, the Tourism Kingston equivalent, has indicated, based on Ernst Young report, that I believe it's 13 conventions over a two or three year period they couldn't get space for because local dance groups were in the convention center. So I give this context only because when we as HLT come in as a third party are projecting event load, we have to make a call on what the calendar prioritization is for, um, for the venue. So i.e. there's a date in the spring, what do we think is the likely event that's running through there? Because all these events that use these buildings aren't created equal in terms of economic impact or profit. Um, so if to put it in the back of your mind as we're, I'm speaking to this, we because of the private ownership, it's a skew towards profitability. So somewhere between RBC Place London and Hamilton is how we projected the convention center to operate. If you don't mind flipping to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'll briefly, I know you all have the full report, I'll briefly go over our key findings. So it's not just the venue that sells, it's the destination as well. And I, I know some of the previous um, delegations were speaking to um, the experience they have in the market, but in terms of destination factors, when we look at comparables, there's good hotel inventory, and I think it was spoke to already, but the peak demand periods are complementary. When we look at occupancy and average daily rate of the hotels, the summer months are, are clearly busy and high rate, um, where it, it falls off a little bit in the spring and fall. And that's complementary to convention center demand, where often, as spoken to by, by previous individuals, that spring and fall is the peak demand period, because if you put yourself with the meeting planners hat on, they don't want those folks that are going on vacation um, with their kids because they're off school um, to miss the conference. So they, they schedule in those shoulder periods to, to make sure they maximize attendance. Um, Kingston obviously has great access to Toronto and Ottawa by car via the 401 and by train via rail. Um, but the last point is important when we look at demand, and that's the, the limited air access. So particularly as it pertains to national groups, um, direct air access is a, is, is the, a big perk. And even one connection air access is, is seen as a bit of a requirement. So the need to connect through Toronto or Ottawa and then drive or be shuttled or take the via is a bit of an impediment when you're looking at those market segments. In terms of the competitive landscape, um, the Kingston meeting space standalone hotel today is limited. I think the largest standalone meeting space in a hotel is 7,200 um, square feet at, at the now soon to be Hilton. Um, other spaces that use for this type of man, such, such as the Leon Center, are 
built for that type of demand. So they fit it in when they can, but it's not the proper facility for it. And then obviously we looked pretty in pretty good detail at facilities that service the GTA. And we kind of grouped them into three groups, south and southwest of the GTA. So your London's, Hamilton's, Niagara Falls, north of the GTA, your Collingwood's, Muskoka's, and then east of the GTA. And what we found is particularly east of the GTA, there's very limited meeting facilities. And then similarly, we looked at to the north, Ottawa, and looked at north of Ottawa, in Ottawa proper, and south of Ottawa. And there's limited feeling, meeting facilities to the south of Ottawa as well. The Dev Centre in Cornwall is really the, the, the big competitor there. So finally, in terms of demand outlook, um, the question is certainly going to come up. The business events industry was one of the most um, significantly impacted industries by the pandemic. So HLT has been doing a lot of work with venues and looking at, at pace data um, to, to gauge that recovery. And the industry hasn't fully recovered as of yet. I think our estimates are about 75 to 80% of 2019, which was a historic high for the business events industry in Canada. Um, but the positive is there's positive indicators. I think London, a, a good comparable market to yours, um, is out publicly saying they're at about 95% of pre-pandemic uh, revenue levels. That market's recovered very strongly. So the bigger Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver markets have recovered strongly. So there's positive signs. And on, on top of that, and, and hopefully it's not apparent based on me presenting virtually today, but that virtual hybrid business model that was a thought that it would take away and be um, sustainable in terms of taking demand from the conference side center sector hasn't proven out and and really where during the pandemic i was doing a lot of work for these venues and they were putting in studios and trying to find ways to get this demand the meeting players haven't made the business model work so the need to meet face to face has been has been underlined um and then finally the primary market for kingston conference center from hlt's perspective is provincial groups today i talked about that car and rail access um and obviously the air access is a limitation um, and that leads to the final point. Improved air access could increase appeal to national groups, but we haven't assumed air access would improve as part of our study. Our demand projections are based on the current environment. Um, so that would really be a shift in demand to, to more national groups if, if air access was improved. So I'll just quickly walk you through the results. Um, if you can flip to the next page here. We, uh, we worked with Populous, who's an one of the most prominent convention center architects um, in North America and really globally. Um, and they looked at the site. You can see some diagrams there that they did, some, some things that they'd look to highlight if they were building a conference center on that plot of land. It's things like maximizing waterfront views and so on, integrating with the Leon Center. But the real important part that we need for the project to look at feasibility is, um, is the cost. So HLT's view is a 15,000 square foot ballroom, another 10,000 square feet of breakout of meeting, and that would really be your front of house rentable space, so 25,000 square feet. And then you have additional support spaces that are required um, with 12,500 square feet of front of house, another 12,500 square foot back of house, and 2,000 square feet of food service. Um, so Populous estimated what we call rough order of magnitude costing based on that program. And that's where you're seeing the range of 33.3 million to 41 million dollars being the capital costs associated with the conference center portion of this program. I will note just quickly on this, we did ask Populous about their experience with integrated projects with say a hotel component or other multi-use things or other, other multi-use purposes. And they mentioned somewhere between 10 to 15% of that budget may be able to save, be saved with synergies with other site uses. We can flip to the next page here. In terms of event load projections, HLT projects 50, this is, these are all in a stabilized year, 15 conventions annually um, with about 43 event days and 6,375 delegates. So it works out to about 400 people per average convention that's there. I do wanna note on our convention total, um, we also have 150 meetings that we projected to run through the venue. And those, the definition between meetings and conventions can vary a little bit in our industry with some centers considering groups of 100 people at convention and others considering those a meeting. So I just want to clarify that HLT's convention projections are all generally greater than 200 attendees at those conventions. So there are out of town delegates going through the meeting supply. Um, additional 13 trade and consumer shows and then partially a reflection of the what I mentioned, the private funding model, a significant food and beverage banquet gala um, event load 95 in a given year. And I mentioned that we have good data from other centers. So all of our projections we were vetting against the actual performance of centers in comparable markets. So you can see the bars there just show Kingston compared to a high and what we consider the comparable set 
a low and a median. So you can see that our projections are right in line with industry averages. If you don't mind flipping to the next slide, please. And that all drives through the pro forma here. Um, we had a revenue number on the previous page. Um, this is assuming this is revenue to the center. So the difference there would be food and beverage revenue where we've assumed a third party operator. The, the different um, models can vary, but it's common to have a third party come in and run the food and beverage for a commission to the venue. And we've assumed essentially based on comparables, what the operating expenses would be associated with the venue, all leading to an annual operating deficit of in and around $100,000 uh, per year. You'll note this doesn't include property tax. These, gen these venues generally don't pay property tax. So we haven't included there, but recognize that that's um, the, the council and then the mayor will be making a decision on, on that. Um, and this operating loss is really consistent with venues of this size. These venues don't sustain their capital. Um, they're often supported by the city because of that economic impact mandate. So these operating incomes are consistent with what we see in the industry. If you could flip to the next page, um, this is the economic impact projection. So we took tourism um, Kingston visitor spending data, particularly for the business event segment, um, took our event load projections and our attendance projections and ran delegate spending estimates. Um, and you can see some amount are spent by local delegates at these venues, some by non-local delegates. So we intentionally broke those out because there's often a view with respect to economic impact that non-local delegate spending is incremental to the destination, uh, whereas often economic impact of local spending can be viewed as a redistribution of dollars. So we wanted to make sure we broke both of those figures out. Um, and then those are the sectors below in the, the donut, below the, uh, the, the non-local and local there. So, and you can see, obviously, a lot of the folks that spoke to you today, lodging is generally the largest component of delegate spending. Uh, transportation is significant as well, though, food and beverage, and then to a lesser extent, retail and recreation. So those are all annual figures of what our event load would support in terms of delegate spending. And then those delegate spending figures we put through the TRIM model, um, which is a model by the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, Heritage and Sport um, in Ontario. So they take Statistics Canada input output tables, a dollar spent in industry have these spin-off effects to the economy. They make them work for the province and different municipalities. So this is obviously looking at the impact specifically of that spending would have in Kingston. Um, and I've highlighted some of the key figures there, 78 incremental jobs associated with the, this development. That doesn't include on-site spending. That is only the impact of delegate spending in the community. Um, 71 of those direct, seven indirect. I haven't included induced for this um, summary. Three and a half million dollars of annual labor income. Again, three million direct and a half million indirect. And then those are the taxes, federal direct taxes, provincial direct taxes, municipal direct taxes, about a million for federal and provincial and a little less for municipal, uh, $10,000. And I should highlight on the taxes, those are taxes on production. So those aren't taxes that folks are spending off of their income. Those are taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, extents applicable and so on. And then if you could flip to the next page. The last thing we want to do, because we are carving out the conference center as on its own, recognizing it's part of a multi-use um, development. We were very clear up front with both Tourism Kingston and the city that the conference center on its own wouldn't be a financially viable project for the private sector. So we wanted to, as part of our report and part of our scope, quantify excess cash flow that would be required from other site uses to make an attractive um, investment for a private sector investor. So what you see at the top, I won't go into a ton of detail, but it's just looking at an expected return on equity with a 40 to 60, 40% uh, 40 um, equity component, as well as an estimate of current debt financing costs. And essentially what that says is for every dollar put in a 10.4% return is what we anticipate the private sector would expect on their, on their investment. And then if you take those capital costs I mentioned before, the 33 million to 41 million, that would impute that a private sector would require $3.4 million to $4.2 million in annual cash flows to support that capital investment. And then obviously, if you layer on top the estimated operating loss that I showed you on the previous pages, um, and just an allotment for annual capital maintenance associated with the building, what it comes to is annual excess cash flow required from other sources, other uses, excuse me, of 3.7 million to $4.6 million. And excess is a key word there because that, if there's a hotel development as part of the um, proposal, obviously the capital associated with that hotel has to be supported with a return as well. So that's why we make the comment of excess cash flow. So things like parking, uh, residential potentially, 
the hotel may all be able to contribute and offsite this excess cash flow. And different investors obviously will look at these deals differently, but we want to give an order of magnitude. What needs to be expected as, as council and mayor look at um, moving this forward to the RFI process. So I'd, I'd welcome now any questions um, that you have on our report. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Councilor Shapes. Now, just to clarify before I start, how many questions do I get? <laughs> so this is a briefing, so you can ask more than two questions. Thank you. I was sure it wasn't a delegation, but I wasn't sure better briefing. Um, thank you for the presentation. I did read the, the initial uh, report and study. Um, However, I did, uh, I sent a, a number of questions to city staff for clarification, which I had. It wasn't until I got responses that I actually realized, I think you did mention it here tonight, that this study is actually just in reference to the conference center and not anything else adjacent to it, correct? That's correct. However, the, the, the idea of this is to have something adjacent to it, such as a hotel. Um, so the projected losses, which are indicator, are only for the, the convention center. That's correct, yes. I think because of the, or my understanding from talking to the city and tourism case up front is because of the wide range of potential other site uses, um, estimating those as part of a clear scope of the project didn't make sense. Okay, so if there is a hotel adjacent to it, um, generally speaking, would it be the same organization that would sort of own, operate both? It's often the case with um, hotels with meeting space, they'll operate together. The size of the hotel can obviously dictate what the operating model was, but there is potential for efficiencies on that um, on that operating income statement if there's shared resources between the two uh, site uses. So if there are sharing resources between the two, then the bottom line is suspected to be a positive revenue source. So, sorry, the positive line, that would be cash flow positive, you mean, or operate, have, generate operating income if the resources were shared? Yeah, so basically they'll be making a profit. So the conference center would probably be making a loss, but the hotel and the grand total would be an actual profit year end, bottom line. I didn't assess as part of the scope the profitability of a 100 room hotel in Kingston um, as part of this, so I, I can't comment on on how it would affect the property. I can speak to the fact that there would likely be some synergies, but where that falls and how the degree to which it is wasn't wasn't within our scope here. Okay, because I'm asking because there's there's asked for this project, and I'm trying to wondering if we're subsidizing one, technically we may be subsidizing the second. So um, I'm trying to get wrap my head around this project and how we can be. Benefiting. So there'll be an opportunity to ask staff once the item comes to the floor that would obviously be able to at least speak to some of the other aspects. So obviously, this is just with respect to the conference center piece. Okay. Um, you made reference to other conferences in other cities. Are they still making neg like negative losses or are they making revenues? Because I also noted in the report here in the one graph that the, the revenues dipped down the first year and then the, the, next, the losses end up going up in years three, four, and five. Is that expected to continue after five years? Yeah, so there was minor expense escalation that exceeded revenue, which caused those slight increases. I think the stabilized years two to five are what to expect in terms of annual operating losses. And, and yes, to your question previously, we have numbers in the full report with financials for Fredericton, for London, and for um, Hamilton, which is fully privately run now. Um, Fredericton, as mentioned, has a pretty significant operating loss because of that mandate, and they got a $950,000 operating subsidy from the government. Um, RBC Place London operates around break even from operations. Again, doesn't pay property tax, doesn't support their capital. Um, they do have within their budget, though, talking about other site uses, there's about $500,000 of parking revenue in there with about $50,000 expense associated with it. So when I mentioned roughly break even, it's with some revenue from other sources. Hamilton, Ernst & Young estimated running at about a $300,000 operating income annually. But again, that was not taking in, or not serving the economic impact mandate. So I do think it's prudent, I think this has been suggested for some controls to be in place if the city is providing funding to ensure that the, the center can serve economic impact purpose and not be booked for local groups primarily. Okay, thank you. 
Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, some questions. So um, this report's recommending 52,000 square feet of convention space. And I'm just trying to envision like what that would look like. Is that all one floor or is that multiple floors? And is that, um, like I think it says, ground floor commercial is what's recommended and a parking garage. So is the convention space then like on floor three, four, five? Like I'm just trying to picture what this looks like in my head. Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. The uh, I, I want to caveat a little bit. It's, it's particularly um, the architects that we work with populace would be the folks that would speak more eloquently to what's possible in terms of uh, design. But I will say, I believe when they looked at the footprint and whether it could fit on the lot, it was looking at a stack program where we really look at rentable space as a primary focus. So that 15,000 square foot main space and the 10,000 square foot of support meeting and breakout would likely be on two floors with support spaces around it. So when you're talking about 52,000, which is taking that front of house space, adding in the back of house, um, it's probably across two floors. Where it falls in terms of ground level versus stacks up with other site uses, I think is without knowing those other site uses and what components of the project and the economics of it, um, it's, it's far too early to tell. So that's why we had the rough order of magnitude costing, um, not recognizing what the other components of the project are to the extent they're gonna be integrated and so on. I see, thank you. Um, a few years ago when we were first talking about this, um, we also envisioned like a walkway up over the road separating the space from the Leon Center. Is that something that you would still recommend with all the knowledge you know of all the other convention centers you've um, analyzed? Yeah, it's a great question. I think integration with the Leon Center and what shape that takes um, I, is, is an important element. I will speak to, I'm, I'm working with Saskatoon currently that's doing an entertainment event planning district um, where the arena and convention are going to be co-located activation of these city spaces between convention centers and, and arenas um, can really be a, a positive impact for the the downtown and there are certain events i think the junos was mentioned as an example um, previously there's certain events that you can leverage the two spaces with and i know there's been tent structures that have been used on that plot of land for events that are going through the Leon Center today. So obviously the extent to which you could in the design integrate the conference center with the Leon Center, I think would be particularly a benefit for those type of events that are able to leverage both buildings. Thank you. And my last question is, um, have you seen any convention centers where the city leases out the land um, for the convention center? Because what we're recommending tonight is if we go ahead with the RFI, we would sell our land that's worth almost $10 million for $1 for the project. And I have a concern with that. So I just wondered what you thought about leasing the land. It's a good question. Um, and let me get back to the one that comes to mind immediately. Um, the Metro Toronto Convention Center is owned by the provincial government. Um, the North Building is on provincially owned land that's leased back. Um, now owned by Oxford Properties, as though one's low plot, but it's leased for the convention are used from Oxford Properties. So it's kind of the inverse now, I guess. The land underneath it's been bought and the province leased it from them for a dollar for 99 years. But let me get back to you. I don't know offhand of a municipality that's leasing land back as part of um, this. Often, I think the nature of that is because so many are municipally owned um, or provincially owned. That, that the need for that lease back isn't required. But I think with the city looking for alternative means of funding, it's something that could be explored, but I don't have a comparable for it offhand. Uh, Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. I have some concerns with the comparison specifically to London. I think we're comparing apples and oranges here. I mean, London is the three, four times the size of Kingston. Was any studies or reviews done of St. Catharines, Guelph, or Lin uh, Windsor? Um, do they have conference centers of the size that we're talking about? That's a good question. And I should mention the program, I mentioned London as a comparable only because proximity to GTA, obviously, um, to somewhat of an educational town. But the program at London is significantly larger than what we've recommended here. Um, so if I just, in terms of both um, exhibit space, ballroom space, and main space. So London is, and let me just get the exact number here. Um, RBC Place London's got 33,000 square feet as their main ballroom. 
So you can appreciate it's double the size of what we're suggesting here in Kingston. So completely agree with you in terms of market size and local market does have some effect on what goes through these buildings. Um, in terms of the specific destinations you mentioned, um, St. Catharines is unique because Niagara Falls Convention Center is pretty nearby, right? Which services that market pretty directly. So it doesn't have its own conference dedicated space. Um, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo's got some major supply nearby. So again, it, it's a little unique relative to Kingston just because Kingston doesn't have the same markets directly beside it that, that it does. Windsor does have the Casino Caesars. Windsor has significant space, much bigger than what we're, we're suggesting here again. Um, the comparators in terms of size that what we've recommended compares to Fredericton, as an example, has about 12,500 square feet. It's a smaller city, um, but drive, has had some success in driving those smaller national conventions we're talking about. So obviously the space we recommend here is slightly bigger, but we're, when we talk about in, in the work we do for the convention centers in Canada, we look at groupings and it's not strictly market size because leisure demand of a destination can affect demand in this industry a little bit, but we're looking at things like Fredericton, Nanaimo, um, Prince George, smaller destinations in Canada. And that's more in line with what we recommend in terms of both event load and convention center size program. I'm also concerned with, um, you indicated in your report that uh, we have rail service and I would, I would challenge that it is very limited right now. And you indicated that we have air, limited air service. We have no air service. Um, so that it's for us to draw in a national convention would be very problematic. So I, I once again reiterate, I think we're comparing a little bit of apples and oranges because what you're referencing are cities that do have airports that are drawing in national entities. Uh, where we don't have that capability. I mean, I reference London again, where there is a direct flight from Ottawa to London that happens two, three times a day, um, and we have none. So I, I'm a bit concerned that the, the items we're being presented aren't matching what uh, is the scope and size of our city. The other, the other question I have is, is more along the lines of our, of our, uh, our accommodation partners. Uh, which are fantastic, but is the report making assumptions that there are no travelers coming in the spring and fall uh, utilizing our downtown? Because um, we know that seniors love to travel on the shoulder seasons because it's less, it's not as busy. So there is some utilization of our hotels in the fall. And will this pre create even more problematic situations if we're drawing in up to a thousand person conference? Yeah, okay, so thank you for the questions. Um, to your first question about the rail access and the no air service, um, completely here, when our national projections were, we did not project a national convention load going through this building for the reasons that you state. Um, it's provincial, there's one to two national conventions a year, which again, those are events that generally we see in destinations also with limiting factors that have specific reasons to go to that destination. Um, the other thing I'll state about group origin when we're talking about them, we look at demand from the meeting planner perspective. So you have to think they want to maximize their delegates at a given event. So for provincial or associations, as an example, it kind of mirrors the population base. So a significant amount of their delegate base lives in the GTA. So proximity to the GTA obviously is a good demand and a care for those provincial groups. So by and large, that convention total is driven by provincial and regional groups. Um, I think we state that in a report. We think national demand for this convention with the current environment because of the destination factors is very limited. So any comment I made about national demand was speaking to future if that's fixed. I think Kingston has, um, has, has a good competitive position if those mitigating factors are resolved. But today and how we projected was based on predominantly drive-in and and to some extent via rail access, but even then it's predominantly drive-in. So it's comparing, it's really comparing Kingston. This is what meeting planners told us when we spoke to them. There's an appetite, particularly among provincial groups to go somewhere else other than Niagara or Collingwood and Muskoka that they've been to historically. So that was the feedback they gave us that influenced our view of understanding how many provincial associations are out there, what's going through the other buildings, where Kingston would fall in terms of attractiveness and going to that market. In terms of your second question uh, about hotel supply, um, we when we looked at the demand projections, we looked at comparable markets, the hotels within one kilometer. Um, so again, the walking distance, I think that was referred to earlier, um, with similar event demand loads. 
And we also looked at occupancy and rate of the hotels. Because I can tell you from my experience right now, if you look at, say, Toronto and Vancouver's hotel supply, it fits a lot of the metrics in terms of number of rooms. But the rates and occupancy are so high right now that the convention center can't get room blocks. So it's hurting demand. When we looked at those characteristics combined, so rate, occupancy, and supply within one kilometer, the Kingston metrics were in line with other comparable metrics, suggesting to us that it could service that demand within the market. Because there's markets today that have similar event loads with similar hotel capacity that are, are managing that demand. So that's the comment about the current hotel supply. I completely hear you in terms of groups that are coming here now. And there is, to some extent, these conferences book years in advance and often get room blocks as part of that. So convention hotels will have different willingness to give up room blocks, but generally 40 to 60% of a given hotel, they'll be willing to lock in a rate years in advance such that they're getting that business. So that's how it would flow in terms of demand. Um, if it's in a position where rates and, and occupancy grow significantly because of this convention center demand, when we've seen that happen in other markets, there's been additional hotel supply then added to the market, but that, that's generally viewed as a good problem to have. So that's, we did double check on all the aspects of hotel occupancy, whether it could be attained under the current supply. And that's why we, uh, why we projected the event load we did. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thanks for the report. I think it's done very, very well and uh, certainly reflects, I believe, very well um, our city and comparable cities. I, I think I just want to make sure you're clear. I, I, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding you, so um, that's only the sound system, not you. But um, I really believe I, I picked up on the, the essential that the synergy created by something like this, uh, I'm, I think about the airport, for example, and, and something that we, we've we worked hard as a city and, and have a, had our frustrations through the pandemic. But would you not say that w w this, um, King, certainly Kingston would become more desirable, uh, even provincially, uh, for for this kind of thing and building that economic synergy and, and having an airport with the potential. So, you know, who, what comes first? You know, well, we have the airport. And so uh, we have to see that, um, you know, all forms of transportation will be benefited, uh, that uh, will will be benefited to, to support this very unique and, and, and exciting opportunity, even so our airport. Yeah, so I think your your question is right, and and we are there's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario associated with all the components that play into these type of developments, right? And I think as third parties, when we come in and look at projected demand, we're very hesitant to project on things that may come in the future as a result of this. But certainly, I can point to markets where um, where conventional activity that then drove hotel development and drove ancillary development around the venue. But I can also point to markets where, where some of those developments didn't come after the conference center was built. So I, I'm hesitant to um, to suggest that cause and effect, i.e. you build this conference center, then you will be able to get more air service. I, I can't see how it would hurt the case if the conference center is running good provincial business, but I'd be hesitant to suggest that this would, would, would immediately attract additional flight service to your airport. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, Mr. Kloss, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so moving on in our agenda, we have no further briefings. Uh, on to petitions. We have a petition bearing approximately 198 signatures with respect to the request to have a crosswalk installed at John Street and Montreal Street, uh, which was delivered to the clerk's department April 17th, 2023. Are there any other petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we have uh, no special motions of congratulations, recognition, or sympathy. Uh, so we will move on to deferred motions. Uh, we have one deferred motion. Deferred motion number one uh, was amend as amended was deferred from the April 18th, 2022 council meeting uh, to allow staff time to hold discussions with friends of Queen Street Kingston. So we now have number one, Ontario Land Tribunal Settlement. Uh, 275 and 283 Queen Street and 364 Barry Street. Uh, can I have a, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we need a mover and a seconder to put that on the floor? Yes, please, Mayor Patterson. Can I have a mover and a seconder to put that on the floor? Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff. Okay, so, uh, so item one is on the floor. The only thing I'm going to note is that clause two was built into the deferral motion. So I'm going to to strike clause two, then it's moot that it was dealt with the motion to defer. So effectively, we now have clause one and clause three that is now on the floor. Is there any discussion? 
A uh, small point of order. I think it's clause three that was done, that we've done because it's before the minutes of settlement. But clause two is something that can continue on into the future before the building is built. Uh, Madam Madden Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Yeah, so Councillor McLaren, so there are three clauses, or three paragraphs, rather, within the clause. The first paragraph deals with the minutes of settlement. The second paragraph is the direct cons to consult, which was in the motion to defer. And then the third paragraph is a staff be directed to encourage podium development managed to include the Friends of Kingston, Queen Street, Kingston, and any further negotiations toward settlement. So that stays. So it's the first and the third that stay. Okay, is there any discussion on the item? Councilor Rich. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, so first of all, I want just speaking uh, very quickly to the deferral before, if I'm able to do that procedurally, I want to thank Council for their support on the deferral uh, from the previous meeting, and to thank city staff for working so quickly to facilitate those meetings. Um, and so if, if what I say uh, sounds a bit of a repetition, uh, I'm sure that this may be something that happens again in the future, uh, and it's not even close to Groundhog Day. So um, I want to start by saying that I've received overwhelming response from community members with regards to this uh, proposed development, uh, overwhelmingly against it. It's my responsibility to represent those views. I said last time it was around 500 emails uh, that since I had been elected that I've received, that since I've been elected, I've been receiving emails before that. Um, and I attended the planning meetings and I did a count and as of a couple days ago, it was 457 against and seven for the development, just as a point of interest. So I wanna start by stating the concerns which uh, fall under two main themes. So we're talking about design and we're talking about process. So on the design of the development as it uh, stands in the agreement, um, there are community members' concerns about height, uh, the 15 stories well above the bylaw as it exists and uh, neighboring buildings, there's concerns about shadowing as a result of said height. There's concerns about parking, only 37 spaces for over 200 units. Um, as someone who used to live on Colburn Street for many years uh, near the development site, uh, parking congestion has always been an issue. Uh, and so this will likely exacerbate it as per the concerns expressed to me. Um, there's also the question of, uh, yeah, so anyways, moving on for process, uh, which has developed a little bit since last time I spoke. Um, so there, was, there were many concerns about the timeline for community response based on the potential settlement, settlement terms and design. Uh, staff recommendation came out April 13th, according to my ref, uh, recollection of the timeline, and the council meeting was April 18th. Um, and while I understand the need for confidential negotiations, uh, Community members were very frustrated with not being able to receive updates. Uh, and I think broadly, speaking more broadly, what I'm seeing here is a frustration with community members uh, feeling that they aren't being heard uh, around these uh, planning proposals and developments. And this is something that is an ability to be heard that continues to be eroded uh, with additional provincial legislation, either on the community level uh, that erosion occurs or through uh, the erosion of the ability of municipal representatives to uh, speak towards planning. Uh, what we need to acknowledge as well as the current reality that city staff are operating within the boundaries and regulations that are put forward by the province and losing tools in their toolbox to negotiate with regards to developments and proposals. Uh, here I'm going to cite a page from a report that was from the previous meeting. As per page 96 of the agenda package from the April 18th council meeting, uh, recent changes to the Planning Act, uh, due to recent changes to the Planning Act, the city no longer has the ability to af negotiate affordable housing through individual development applications. And when we look at this proposal, there's uh, funds instead of actual affordable housing units that's being provided, which I'm grateful for the, the developers uh, putting forward the funds for that, but there have been a number of concerns that have been expressed to me about the units not being in the building itself. 
Um, and if we look at Bill 197, it took away the ability to secure community benefits for additional height and density that can now only be introduced with bylaws. And if we look at the OLT itself, there's a study from the Hamilton Spectator that showed that from January 2022 to September 2022, OLT rulings were in favor of the tribe. Uh, they were in favor of the developer 97% of the time. So all of these basically uh, are factors that have contributed to this boiling point that we have here uh, within Kingstown District, uh, specifically in this area. And due to the overwhelming Oh, thanks for the little blinking thing. Due to the overwhelming uh, concerns that have been expressed to me, I cannot vote in favor of this. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you will uh, support me in, in that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. To those who are here tonight, um, I know that the process feels unfair. Regardless of what happens here tonight, though, it's really important to note that you do have official party status at the Ontario Land Tribunal, so you still retain your right to make your case in front of the tribunal. And you will continue to have the opportunity to negotiate a settlement, that's not going away. The Planning Act requires the approval authority, which in this case is City Council, to render a decision on zoning amendment applications within 90 days after a complete application is submitted. The 90-day decision period has been in place in one form or another for many years now, this isn't new. Council didn't make a decision within the 90 days because they never had the opportunity. Council was never presented with a recommendation from planning staff, but it's not because planning staff did anything wrong. Because of the Planning Act, which is provincial legislation, after technical review comments were provided by the city, the ball was in the developer's court. Meanwhile, the 90-day clock kept ticking. When the 90 days were up, the developer was within their right to appeal to the tribunal. And this feels unfair, like a legislated loophole. But again, this is provincial legislation. Everyone involved in this file is playing by the rules, but the rules don't feel fair, especially if you're a community member who's worried about your neighborhood changing. Acknowledging that it's true that the process completely feels unfair, it's also true that this particular project meets all four of Council's strategic priorities. Our priorities came from community feedback. They're based on what we heard at the doors and what people wrote in to us. These are informed priorities. First off, Kingston needs housing of all kinds. And yes, we absolutely need affordable housing, but we also need market rentals just like these. It's not one or the other, it's both and more. It's also important to note, as Councillor Ridge mentioned, that Council has no power to compel any developer to include affordable housing. That would be really nice, please advocate for that. And while it's true that this building will not have affordable housing units in it, it's also true that the developer's $300,000 donation to Lionhearts will have a significant impact on our community. And I'm hoping staff can please tell us what the $3,000 donation can help to achieve because it doesn't sound like much in terms of buying a unit. So what are we actually hoping might happen with this money? Sue Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, Lion Arts have been actually working um, to try to acquire a property. This property uh, will most likely be donated uh, to them to operate uh, low-income supportive housing. Now, they will need some funds to do some renovations to the property. The 300000 would be utilized for that, and the property would be able to accommodate transitional supportive housing, um, deeply affordable for about eight people. And when I say deeply affordable, I mean Ontario Works Shelter Allowance and ODSP Shelter Allowance. And I, I think those are probably some of the lowest ones that we would have in the city. Thank you. Um, I think it's worth noting that there's no way we could get that in that building for 300 grand. Um, Council also identified environmental stewardship and climate action as one of our pillars. And as infill development, which we all want, this project does not require any clear cutting or habitat destruction. There are no wetlands, no significant woodlands, and no species at risk. This building will be built to a high env environmental standard and it will result in reduction of GHG emissions because when people feel comfortable walking, they will walk. I believe that this project will help to foster a connected and caring community and support our downtown economy. Bringing people to live at Queen and Barry will mean there will be more people around meeting up, attending events, maybe conferences, who knows, uh, shopping, eating in restaurants. 
And it's all well and good for people to like downtown, but if people don't spend money there, businesses can't stay open. We just saw classic video close. There was a huge community response to that. People in Kingston are proud of our historic downtown because it's really unique. But if we want a vibrant downtown, not a vacant ghost town, we need people. We can't rely on tourists alone. This is a good project. Is it perfect? No. But Heritage Services have signed off. It will bring much needed rental units online. It will have a positive impact with respect to climate action. And it will make Queen Street feel more like an actual place in a community space. So because this does not impact the Friends of Queen Street at the Ontario Land Tribunal, and because it aligns strongly with Council's strategic priorities, I'm in favor of this tonight. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'll keep this brief. So there's lots of reasons to support this. And we often hear all the negative ones of why not to. But wow, Councillor Stephen, you literally just hit the nail on the head. It ties in with all our strategic priorities. I can't follow that. That, that was absolutely why this project should be supported. Just bang on. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Sun? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, um, echoing uh, Councillor Bohm's comments, so thank you, Councillor Stephen and uh, Councillor Rich, for your kind comments. <clears throat> I think this is the time for us as a council to move forward. We are struggling for economic growth. We are struggling to meet the challenges with the homelessness and growing demand of the houses. Just the shadowing on, on my house is not enough that I should stop the uh, development. Um, this is a good project to um, bring more economic growth in, in our city and meet the demand of uh, rental property or uh, bringing the new, new families to, to the town who can have the access. Right now, people are suffering. I get, as a community member, I get a lot of emails from our own community that the doctors, the engineers, they are educators who want to move to Kingston, but they're having a difficult time either buy a house or rent a house. So I have no problem to say that this is a great project and I am um, along with my uh, colleagues to say yes to the, this project. And I think it's, uh, it's due to, uh, due with all respect to uh, the, my, our fellow Kingstonians who are in the favor and not in the favor, but it's not time to see who's in the favor, is not, not in the favor. We have to look at uh, community at large for our city, what is the benefiting um, the, the majority of the citizens in Kingston. And I think this project will serve well to the majority, and I will, uh, my, my support is there for this project. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, Councillor Stephen, uh, well said. Um, I can't really add a lot more to that, uh, like Councillor Bohm just said. Um, Kingston has the second lowest vacancy rate in Ontario at 1.2%. Um, and judging by the, uh, the two restaurant uh, owners that we had present earlier today, the ebb and flow of uh, winter, early spring, late fall, uh, we need more individuals downtown to support those businesses to, to prevent, or not prevent, but to stretch out that, that peak uh, and make it a more viable uh, downtown for everybody. So I'm in favor of this. Uh, I completely understand uh, the situation in that there are, a, a, this has been a loophole that has been uh, driven through, um, but I know staff have worked really hard to try and find some resolution in this. And, and that's the other reason I wanna support this is that a lot of time and energy has gone into this. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So thank you to my colleagues for their comments because I think um, they've hit on a number of the uh, points that I want to make. But I, I'm going to put a couple questions out there because I want to make sure that uh, all of the information is in the public view. So uh, my first question, how will this development impact the heritage properties, if at all? Mr. Burke. Um, pardon me, Councillor Glenn, I lost my train of thought when I was looking at the uh, mayor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, could you repeat the question, Councillor? Councillor Glenn, if you could just repeat the question for Mr. Sure. Um, how will this development impact the heritage properties in the area, if at all? Oh, Ms. Campbell. 
Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it was staff's assessment that the impact of this property was fairly negligible on the adjacent heritage designations. I think it is important to note, as the councillor is suggesting and to put on the floor for everyone's awareness, the property itself is not designated, nor does it lie within a heritage area, um, as identified in our official plan or any of our policies. And as such, it's really assessed based on adjacency and the impacts on the properties. And the minutes of settlement actually represent some improvements that will further support the adjacent property, um, most notably the one that shares the, the boundary with the property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, my next question. So we've discussed the impact of having higher density uh, buildings in terms of the environment, but could anyone please speak to the environmental features that are going to be included in this building? Mr. Park. Uh, thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, Podium is uh, one of the developers in the city that actually is, I would say, environmentally sustainable. Uh, they're, first, they're the first one to build a zero carbon design standard at 600 Princess. That's under construction right now. As far as 275 Queen Street, uh, what they are doing in terms of uh, being uh, environmentally friendly and sustainable, uh, first and foremost, they're intensifying a uh, underutilized site, and that's sort of first and foremost. What you're doing is you're bringing people into an area uh, that is not currently fully developed. You're bringing them to an area where the services are already in the ground uh, and on the ground, such as transit. Uh, you have uh, commercial areas they can walk to, parks. It is uh, because of that, there's less requirement for the use of vehicles. Hence, less greenhouse gas being emitted, which also is reflected in the parking standard within the development. Um, they're providing ample bike parking for the entire development, so they're encouraging alternative forms of transit. Uh, so there's biking, walking, uh, Kingston Transit. Uh, they're also doing geothermal on this building, which uh, is what they're doing on their other development further up Princess Street. And what this does is it provides a heat cooling exchange that makes the building much more energy efficient. And as a result of that, they don't have to put as much mechanical equipment on the roof that requires gas to run, such as coolers or machinery, fans. So it's gonna actually be a quieter building in that effect. Um, they're also providing green roofs on the development, uh, which is an improvement over the existing site, which does not have green roofs, because right now what you're getting is asphalt, which is reflecting heat and creating runoff. They have to contain all their stormwater management within the site as well, which is environmentally sustainable and responsible. Uh, they have not included balconies on the majority of the building. I'll say 90% of the building. That's energy efficient because you don't have balcony use doors going open and being closed. So that on top of they will still be meeting all the requirements under national and provincial building codes for green build. Thank you. So would it be safe to say that a person living in this building has a far smaller carbon footprint than those living in most traditional homes in our community? Through you, Your Worship, I would say that is an accurate statement, Councillor. Okay, thank you very much for answering my questions. Um, I note that there was a recent article in the Globe and Mail where CMHC has reported that it expects a 32% drop in new home construction due to inflation and labor shortages. So we are running up against a hard wall in terms of being able to build and build anything that is going to be affordable, not just to those who are struggling um, from an income perspective, but from those in the middle class as well and uh, at the upper levels of income. So it's contingent upon us, in my opinion, to make sure that we build enough supply. I understand that there are a lot of people who are what I would call supply skeptics, who don't believe that simply bringing more market um, rentals on board is actually going to improve the situation. But I would say that this is one of the rare areas where any research that's been put out actually does demonstrate that supply actually impacts on um, affordability. While it may not initially lower costs, it will lead to some stability. And I think it's important that we recognize stability is also a key thing that we need to consider when we're looking at what we're building here. So um, fluctuations in rent are difficult for people to handle. Um, being concerned about how much it's gonna go up 
So this is one of the other reasons I think I'm going to be voting in support of this. Um, oftentimes the other thing that we see when we build more units is there is a migration to the newer units which frees up some of those older units and this is where we also um, get that control in terms of the cost of actual rentals. So we need to look at this from a broader perspective. It may not be affordable, but it's an opportunity for our community to house more people, to open up more opportunity, um, and it also is a way to decrease the risk of people being displaced. Um, if we don't have enough supply, there's simply no place for people to go. So my concern is that if we don't vote for this, then um, <laughs> what we're doing is we're closing down those doors. We're closing down the options for more people in our community to actually have a home, which I've spoken about oftentimes, that we refer to housing units, but we don't talk about homes. And this is what this is. This is going to be opportunities for people to have homes, to have a place to live. And I think to the market skeptics, uh, again, to the supply skeptics, what I'm going to say is that market rate housing complements rather than competes with affordable housing. And we need to recognize it's not one or the other, it is both. And so if we're going to get out of the housing crisis, we have to do this kind of building. It will add to the vibrancy downtown. It will make sure we continue to have a community. And that's, I think, what we're all looking for at the end of the day. And the site is one that, as we've heard, is underutilized. And uh, the environmental footprint is going to be positive. So I'm going to vote in favor. OK, thank you. Is there anybody else? Councillor McLaren. Thank you. And um, we got a letter recently from a lawyer explaining certain ideas. And I just want to fact check a few things. Um, one of the things claimed is that it might be too late for the um, Friends of Queen Street to put in anything into this. I understand that if this were to pass today, we'd be passing a bylaw that uh, references Schedule A. May I ask, is everything about this development in Schedule A, or are there still issues or questions or more details to be hammered out? Mr. Park. Thank you, and through your worship, the proposal before us tonight that's in the minutes of settlement in Schedule A, which includes the bylaw itself, is really establishing the land use permissions associated with the site. So we're talking about height, built form, density, massing, and that's the real nexus of what land use planning is here tonight, and that's what's before you. We do have a hold that is on the uh, proposed zoning bylaw, which looks to address matters of technical review, and that'll be addressed as part of our site plan control application in the future. So while we're tonight establishing the basis of land use, and yes, it's gone through a technical review, it recognizes that there's still more technical review to implement this building on the site. So we do have that additional level of review that's gonna have to happen as part of site plan control. Thank you, and uh, under all that, would the friends of Queen Street be allowed to participate in any of that? Thank you, and through your worship, the Friends of Queen Street are actively engaged in this process that we're in tonight. They have submitted a, a large amount of communication into this process ever since becoming aware of the settlement that was proposed, and they were apprised of that on April 5th when the applicant directly sent to their legal representation everything that was to be posted on DASH that day. So not only was it sent directly to them, but it was posted publicly on the city's website. Uh, the Friends of Queen Street are also a party at the Ontario Land Use Tribunal, and they are actively a part of this appeal that's before us. So they have a seat at the table to continue to participate in this process. And additionally, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Additionally, uh, we've had two meetings with them over the past week, and we can continue to have meetings with them post tonight, leading up to any future uh, case management conferences as well as the actual hearing. So there are multiple opportunities for continued participation. Thank you. So it's essentially it's not over yet. There is still a possibility of change. Um, but the next question, I guess, is with regards to the actual leverage that anybody would have over the developer. Is it true that 97% of applicants' um, applications to the tribunal actually favor the developer? Just to confirm that it, it's true, right? Uh, Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, I certainly can't confirm um, the findings of the Hamilton Spectator, but it is our experience that with the role of the Ontario Land Tribunal as a de novo hearing um, adjudicator, there's a lot of uncertainty for municipalities because the decision is being made from scratch based on the evidence that is before the Ontario Land Tribunal. So what we see a lot in the context of the OLT is a willingness 
for municipalities to settle and to have some participation in the process rather than putting the file in the hands of a third party adjudicator. Thank you. And by de novo, that you mean the adjudicator can decide what he or she decides to listen to or not listen to? So for example, they are under no obligation to listen to anybody and can make a decision as they see fit? Through you, Your Worship, the role of the tribunal is to determine whether the proposed development is representative of good land use planning based on the policies that are in front of them, including the official plan and the provincial policy statement, as well as the hallmarks of good land use planning. This is achieved through an adversarial process involving examinations and cross-examinations and submissions, and every case is going to turn on its facts. Um, there is certainly a fair amount of discretion on the part of the tr tribunal member, um, but certainly they are guided by the applicable policies that will be in front of them. Thank you. And another term that was brought up was without prejudice. If these settlements are turned down today, would the developer be able to present their original uh, proposal without the city's negotiated changes? Through your worship, if council were to refuse the minutes of settlement, then there is no agreement between the applicant and the developer, and they're fully within their right to proceed with the original proposal that they had presented. And if that is the case, then the actual leverage that we have is basically the difference in cost for delaying this for a couple of years versus getting it done sooner, which is not very much. Would that be about accurate? Through your worship, I believe that's accurate. I think in the context of a settlement, there are opportunities to obtain concessions on certain performance standards or certain additional contributions, in this case, the form of a affordable housing contribution that might not otherwise be available through the adversarial process. So if we were to vote this down, they would take it to the tribunal. Was the original proposal larger, um, probably more profitable for them than this proposal? Mr. Park, through you, Your Worship, the uh, proposal that is before you today in terms of gross floor area is 20% less than the original proposal. And the podium height has been reduced from a maximum of five stories to three stories around, which represents about a 40% reduction in the podium height. And the setbacks from the three, uh, two of the abutting streets, Queen and Colburn have all been increased, so it gives a greater sense of public space and, and feel. Okay, so if we were to reject this, the likelihood is we'd get a 20% larger building and a 40% larger podium, no money to Lionhearts, and no green roof? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, that is certainly a potential outcome. Okay, so the best that we could do if we were to reject this, we'd get a better build or a larger building, and it would just be delayed a number of years? I mean, the tribunal process is a year and a half to two years. Ms. Morley? Um, through your worships, um, I certainly don't want to create any expectation that council's decision alone tonight will speed things up um, all of that much because Friends of Queen Street is a party to this appeal and will have the right to oppose the settlement, so it will proceed to a full hearing. Um, sorry, what was the rest of your question? <laughs> <laughs> um, is it likely that... Uh, well, no, I think you answered it. It's close enough. Okay, great. <laughs> and uh, with that, that's enough for me. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Councillor Sanek. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, when this application was before um, the Ontario Land Tribunal back on March 20th, uh, the adjudicator urged all three parties to negotiate. Um, it's right there in the minutes that... Um, it was admitted that, you know, uh, there had been no discussions to date. All three parties expressed openness to settle. And then what we saw was that the applicant just came to the city and that the friends were left out. Um, when council approved the deferral two weeks ago, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that there were two meetings held, but then there was nothing. There was nothing. And what I had hoped was just some sort of concession, right? We're still only 37 parking spaces. Like with those two meetings, 
We couldn't have increased the parking spaces at all. I'm talking to the applicant. And, you know, the shadowing is still there. The substantial wind effects is still there. Like, what happened? You know, with the Capitol condo, we have um, a letter here, and there's a quote that after a long process, right, uh, the city was pleased that both sides sat down and came up with a plan that worked for everyone. In this case, 285 Queen Street, the side sat down and then the applicant got up and left. And there was nothing. And all I was looking for with the deferral was just some sort of concession. And if there had been some concessions going into tonight's meeting, no matter how small, um, I would have been prepared to probably support it. But seeing that nothing happened out of those two meetings, you know, that was emailed to us yesterday at 2 p.m. yesterday, the applicant said to the friends, there is no change at all uh, to what was, you know, uh, before us on April 18th, just really, really disappointing. And for the fear of, oh, no, like now we might go back to OLT and um, if we reject the settlement and we could go back to what was the original proposal, well, maybe that's better. The friends have kind of indicated to us that might be better because there'll be less bedrooms because with what came before for us with the negotiation were additional bedrooms, even though less square footage, more bedrooms means more people, more cars, et cetera. So for this um, you know, decision tonight, I support my fellow counselor, Councillor Ridge, um, by voting against this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I have some questions. It's going to be a slightly less optimistic tone than Councillor Stephen. Um, so assuming this settlement goes through, this doesn't take away the ability of these parties to, to continue to negotiate towards settlement, correct? Ms. Morley? Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, that's correct. We do have two very recent examples in the city of Kingston where an entity with party status uh, opposed a settlement that was reached between the settlement or between the city and the applicant, and that matter still proceeded to a full hearing um, with arguments presented by both sides. Perhaps the most um, well-known example is the North Block, where the city and Homestead executed minutes of settlement. The Frontenac Heritage Foundation opposed that settlement, and the matter certainly proceeded to a full hearing with Frontenac Heritage Foundation having the opportunity to make its arguments. Um, I understand that you are all in receipt of correspondence from Podium's legal counsel who has made a commitment to ongoing negotiations up to the point of a hearing. Thank you. A follow-up question. Um, has there been an example in recent past where we've come to uh, a settlement with a developer and a third party has won yeah, at the tribunal? Hmm? Uh, Ms. Morley? Uh, through your worship. Um, the most recent example of a situation where the third party was successful would be 223 Princess Street. That was not a settlement. It was a situation where council approved the proposal that was before them. Uh, the matter proceeded to a hearing and the tribunal overturned uh, the zoning bylaw amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'm just gonna speak very honestly. Uh, I. I'm torn about this, and I understand that if we approve this tonight, it's 15 and 3, and if we don't, we go back to the initial settlement. That's my understanding. I think Councillor McLaren laid that out. Um, I think the challenge that I'm having with this is if we turn this down, you're, we're all relying on a body appointed by Doug Ford. I don't think that's going to get us where we want to be. This is a government that is bulldozing the green belt. I don't think he's a friend of the green belt. I'm not sure he's a friend of uh, Queen Street, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I take to heart the information we've gotten from the community, and so much of my time on council has been about deciding between what I consider worse options and bad options. Um, this is hard, but if I have to choose between those two, I have to choose what I think is gonna cause the least harm here. So I will, in, I will vote in favor of this, uh, just because I think that that's where we have to be right now. And I, I think it's unfortunate that all the delegated authority we've had as a municipality is being stripped away and that we have to keep making these kinds of decisions. But that's where I stand tonight. Thank you, Councillor Shaves. Thank you. Um, 
I've learned in the short time here on council that the input that council and the planning committee have on developments has changed drastically over the past few months with the provincial changes such as Bill 23, which is concerning whoever out of our control. Now, I have to give credit to Council Stephen, who stated very clearly some of the other comments I wanted to make this evening. Um, so I have no other further comments, and I just want, hope that further discussions do occur between the three parties at the OLT. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of 10 to 3. Councillor Ridge, Osanic, and McLaren opposed. Okay, so moving on, we have no other deferred motions. We will move on to reports. Uh, first up, we have report number 41 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 41 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Okay, there are two clauses. Uh, would anyone like those clauses dealt with separately? If not, we will deal with them as a whole. So Clause 1, uh, deeming bylaw to deregister plan of subdivision. And Clause 2, spring into summer, Saturday, May 20th, 2023, free Kingston Transit. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to report number 42 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that report number 42 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, first clause, a capital project status report, fourth quarter 2022. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, clause two, 2023 final tax levy and tax rates. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause three, affordable housing project, homes for heroes. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause number four, conference center update and next steps. Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Just a quick question to staff. Um, in regards to a traffic study of any, has, has a traffic study been evaluated in this area? And my concern is, um, and I just want to be clear to our business folks that are listening, I'm, I, I want, I'm in supportive of this, but I'm, I'm just laying out my concerns. So everyone just <laughs> relax. Um, the, <laughs> my concern is we have a Leon Center that when the Frontenacs, you know, uh, they average between three and 4,000 attendees for a game, sometimes up to five when they're doing really well in a season. We have a brand new ferry that it will be coming soon, I'm assuming this fall, um, and it has at least double the capacity of a current one, so it's going to add more of a load in that area. Uh, we obviously will have the convention center, which will have up to 1,000 attendees, not obviously everyone in a vehicle, but it'll add a lot more foot traffic. And then we have our very reliable causeway um, that will cause issues. So I'm just wondering traffic. Okay, who would, uh, yep, see you, Hurdle. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and through you. So, um, Councillor Amos, I, I appreciate uh, the questions. I, I will say, we're, we're not at that stage yet. So a couple of things. What is in front of council tonight is not a decision to go ahead and move to construction or sell the land. That, that's not what we're asking council to do. All we're asking council to do is issue a request for information, a non-binding one, that would basically explore the possibility with the private sector whether or not the proposal that we have or what we have in mind is feasible. If it's not feasible, we'll hear, I'm sure, quite you know, clearly from the private sector that that's not a proposition that they're willing to entertain. But to respond to your question, Councillor Amos, if there was a proposal that seemed feasible, we would come back to Council 
we would, the next step would be to actually issue an RFP, a request for proposal, which would then start to outline some pretty clear requirements uh, for this. And then this is where studies for traffic would come in because any development on this property, whether it includes a conference center or it ends up being a lot of housing, much needed housing in downtown, would require a traffic study and would be required to go through a land use application. So it will come in time if we get to that point. Hopefully we do, hopefully there is merit to, to this proposal, but that's something that we need to actually test out in the private sector market. Thank you. Okay, next on my list is Councillor Shapes. I do support this and I don't. I do have concerns in regards to some of the asks on behalf from the city, but I'm looking, I, I can accept looking more into this project and approving this at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Sun. Excuse me, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, uh, the uh, Tourism Kingston, uh, and all the delegates who brought this in information. Um, it's a pretty exciting um, project. Uh, my question is to the staff. Um, for how long we will be able to operate this facility with the deficit? And what is the plan we can have if we approve the, this project for go ahead? Then when, how, is, how much time it will take us to e even break even? or we will continue to operate as we operating the airport in deficit for many years, which will be extra burden on the taxpayer. Say your hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor. Uh, the good news, Councillor Hassan, is that we actually are not proposing that the city own and operates this facility. We are proposing as part of this RFI, what we are putting forward is that this would be a privately owned and operated conference center. Um, having said that, we do recognize based on all the research that's been done in other communities, there have been either a mix of provincial, federal, and municipal capital contribution to make such projects work. If it was a super financially viable proposition, the private sector would already be building conference centers on their own without any kind of federal, provincial, or municipal support, and they would be making a ton of money. That's not the case anywhere at all. So it's either we try to figure out, either we put money into it, which staff are saying, mm, let's maybe use those dollars for housing or for an aquatic center or something else along those lines, but let's try to leverage some of our properties and turn that into the hands of the private sector to see what they can do with it. And the support that we're proposing would possibly be the outcome in terms of a uh, reduction in property taxes. And I do mean reduction. These would be new property taxes, not going to existing you know, taxpayers and taking money away from them or adding to their burden but new property taxes, the conference center portion, could be exempted for a period of time to enable an operation to become more sustainable. The other element is up to five year contribution from the MAT tax, which again is leverage from hotel rooms, um, not from our direct taxpayers. And that would be up to five years, up to $110,000 per year, would depend of course on the financials, and that's something that we would need to evaluate, but it would absolutely not be the responsibility of the city to operate and finance the operations. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I have a question for staff is, do we have any idea of the sense of like what the private market would be just from any other research that we've done? Because I know that that's gonna be the make or break for me if we get you know, proposals back or something. Say your hurdle. So thank you, and through you. Good question, Councillor Tozo. I, I have to say that uh, based on all the research and the um, experts that we've worked with, 
uh, they've never been exposed to a project that includes a conference center within such a larger development. Typically, you would see conference center maybe with hotel and restaurant and some parking. But we're, what we're really proposing is, is outside the box, and we're trying to be creative in our approach here. Um, in terms of proposals that we will receive, I, I am not sure. I know we're going to try to test the market outside of Kingston. The, um, the um, and Barry Lyon that we will be working with actually has connections uh, far broader than Kingston, so that will help us to reach out to a larger market. Thank you. A follow-up question is, I noticed that we have substantial parking reserves and that we're going to delve into that. Why do we have $18 million in parking reserves? Like, that's a lot of money. See you, Hurdle? Like, who, who are we doing? Is this all, are this all tickets? <laughs> like, I'm going to go try to get a refund and bite my next parking ticket. Like, Thank you. <laughs> and through you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, parking revenues obviously come from uh, a number of, um, of different areas, permits. Uh, we have, you know, people that are paying parking uh, by the hour, for example, those types of things. And we also, of course, have parking tickets that contribute to these revenues. Um, the, the intent, of course, has always been to, to be able to put money into a reserve so that over time we could look at building more parking structures or incorporating parking in new development as we are taking parking away in the downtown. And, and we are through various redevelopment. So the intent here is to be able to replace that parking um, that's currently existing within the Frontenac lot. Thank you. Um, and I re don't recall if the, this, this was brought up. It's been kind of a busy night. Um, do we know how long the request for proposal uh, will be going out in the market and testing this for when we can expect a report back? Do we have an idea? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm expecting that sometime probably in late fall we would bring something back to council late fall or early winter. I want to make sure that we take the proper time to do uh, an outreach to the market and that we're not rushing this with a, you know, a few weeks. I think this is a significant proposal and it will take some time. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, there's no harm in getting more evidence and getting more information and seeing where the market is. Um, my, I do support this. I will vote in favor of it, but I, my, Support of this really does depend on the private sector doing most of the legwork with this. Um, we're not in an environment, in my view, where we can contribute a ton for, for the municipality. We just have priorities of housing. We have priorities of, pro of poverty. So if the, they come back and they expect more from the municipality, I think that's really where my, I'm, I might walk away from this. But I am really looking forward to this. I know that this has been on the agenda a long time. It's been here again, again, and again, and we can't just keep doing things again and again and expect different results. We're not Leafs fans. Um, that's a little bit of humor there. Um, I, I think that this could be a very beneficial thing for the downtown based on the presentations that we've seen, and I do hope that this type of proposal does generate the kinds of interest that we get from the private sector. So this has my support. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, essentially when thinking about this, uh, the way that I consider it is when areas of the city or different groups in the city struggle, they often turn to the city for grants, bursaries, some type of financial support. So we heard tonight that the arts community would benefit greatly from this. We know that they at times struggle with funding, and we know that we provide funding for them. So I think it's something where when we say we don't want to fund this as a municipality, we have to be very careful with that because really what we're doing is seed funding, but that will also free up dollars in the future as these groups become more sustainable, as larger and larger conferences come here. You look at the downtown of Kingston, it's a gem, but it's also been really hard hit over the last couple of years. Whenever it's under threat, everybody's gonna to turn to city council to find a way out of that, to make sure that it maintains its vibrancy. So again, an investment in even just researching this conference center and some seed money for it is really an investment in our downtown and maintaining that vibrancy. So we have to be very careful when we consider that yes, there will be some municipal funding that goes into this, but don't see it as lost money. This is money that's going to generate revenue 
in the future. This is money that, you know, you spend 100000 and it returns itself tenfold over and over and over again in jobs, in tourism, in a conference center that puts Kingston on the map in between Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal. We have an opportunity here to explore this. And I can tell you right now, there are many municipalities of smaller sizes that are creeping up on us slowly. Napanese on the rise, Brockville's on the rise, Belleville's on the rise. So we don't want to miss this opportunity. They all kind of look to Kingston. And if there's something that we pass the buck on, you can be sure that they're going to grab it. And then all of a sudden, it's not Kingston everybody wants to go to because we don't have a conference center. It's Brockville where everybody's stopping or it's Belleville. Kingston's a desirable place. There's a few things we're missing. This is one of them. So for the future economic prosperity of this entire area and this region, this is something that I think this council and however long it takes, maybe even the next council, really has to explore and get on the ground. There's a reason we've been talking about this for 10 years, because it's something, there's always going to be the demand for it. And as somebody who's held multiple conferences and been the president on some committees, one of the biggest things I struggled with was finding a venue that could host it. And ultimately, you do at times. There are many conferences that end up holding it in multiple venues. And then transit becomes an issue, getting people to where they need to go. So having a one-stop shop everywhere just makes sense. This is, this is one of the gaps in our city. And this is something where, you know, we've had a lot of great accomplishments over the last eight to ten years. This is something that will continue to allow Kingston to punch above its weight, not just regionally, but internationally as well. So I think this is a great endeavor and I think it's long overdue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Osterhoff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. And um, I would just echo, um, <laughs> uh, you can only say so much. I'm very, very excited about this opportunity and uh, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but um, a, you know, Councillor Bohm, just the two things I picked up from him was, let's not miss this opportunity. And uh, this makes sense. And uh, I really appreciated all the support uh, from our uh, downtown associations, our, our um, you know, Speak Kingston, our arts. Um, I don't want to miss anybody, but uh, you all play a very important role. To me, it's like a, like a, like a think tank of, 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 of synergy of, of people who know and live it and experience it, our downtown uh, and and it's it's not just the downtown. It's a it's a synergy that will 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 go right right to border to border and even in countryside. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is something we need to and ought to, and and I'm sure we will support it because we 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 uh, we see the vision and the opportunity. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, three of you, some questions to staff, please. So um, if we know that this is going to be an 18-story building. Do we have any idea how many st um, stories, how many units for the apartment, like the residential section, we might have here? And I'll tell you why I'm asking. I'm concerned about the 169 spots that's going to be going in the RFI. I think that's um, not, like, I think we need more because we have to take into account whatever, like say it's two floors of residential and I don't know, maybe like 20 units on each floor, I have no idea, but we need to incorporate parking into that 169 number of parking spots because as you said, um, we don't have, we don't wanna lose our downtown parking supply because it's so important for all the businesses downtown. See you, Hurdle. Thank you and <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor. So. Currently, what council has endorsed are guidelines for uh, that particular block. Guidelines are not the same as a zoning uh, approval. So there is, um, although the, the guidelines do provide the maximum of height of 18 story, there is nothing that obligates a proponent from submitting something that's different than that. So I just want to point that out. Again, there will have to be a complete land use application that's followed for this particular development if it was to ever occur. As far as the number of units, I honestly do not know that. I think that's something that we would get further down the road because what we would see is the private sector would put forward proposals based on what they think uh, works for their pro forma. So if they feel different businesses have different business models, so if they feel that they need more residential to make 
the conference center work, that's where they would probably um, put more emphasis. And some may actually put more emphasis on commercial space. So we, we might see a variety of those proposals come back. So the exact number is not known. As far as the parking, I do want to be clear that the parking we're talking about is a replacement of what is there. It's not the parking that's going to supply any residential unit. So if there are residential unit, whoever's providing parking will need to think about how parking is provided above and beyond because those are brand new residential unit and would not necessarily fall under the public parking spaces. Okay, uh, thank you. So <laughs> like the way I see it, if we do the RFI for a minimum of 169 spots, that's what we're going to get back is 169 parking spots for this proposed garage. <laughs> Am I right? And then like my fear is that then those permit spots will be lost because some of those spots will be, be reserved for the days of events. And then where do the permit people you know, park? Um, I work downtown, I have a spot at the Anglin, and so I am very in tune with um, having to drive downtown and park every day. And that's why I don't want to see the loss of those um, permit spots. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and um, through Mr. Mayor. So to be clear, we wouldn't be proposing a city contribution for parking for what would be um, private residential parking or um, commercial parking. So the parking contribution that we are proposing is specifically for public parking. If um, a private proposal comes back and they do not want to supply that, then you know we would need to look at what they're proposing. But they would have a responsibility to provide parking for their residential units as well as their commercial space that is outside of public parking. The other thing to, to keep in mind, and I appreciate parking downtown is an important topic, but we can't put all of the downtown parking into one development because then we'll have a massive parking structure. That's essentially what we would end up with. So the thinking here is to make sure that we replace the existing public spots that are currently on this site plus parking that may be needed for residential or commercial, and that we look at other properties that may be redeveloped in the downtown and how can we incorporate public parking in these other locations and, and properties. Thank you. Um, one more question about parking that then is not related to the number of parking spots, but um, it's for the rates. If then our public parking goes into this um, privately owned 18-story plus structure, um, would the city still have control over um, the public parking spot rates? You know, if it's still going to be $99 per month, or would the uh, private owner be able to increase it to whatever they would like to? See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and three, Mr. Mayor. So I, I don't have that level of detail at this point, um, as we have not even entered an RFI. I think that's something that we would be able to provide to council once we've had a sense to gauge the public, um, sorry, the private market, and see what the sector is willing to put forward and what kind of of partnerships we may be looking at, or business deals we may be looking at. So. Unfortunately, that's not the level of detail that I'm able to provide tonight, uh, Councillor Sanic, in terms of the rates for parking. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is just about the uh, land appraisal. So we know that the last appraisal for Block 4 was done in 2019, and it was um, eight point something million dollars. Um, at what point are we doing the new appraisal? I know the report says we'll do the new appraisal. Is that going to be before we do the RFI? Or will that be when um, the results of the RFI comes back to council? Sarah Hurdle. Thank you. And uh, through Mr. Mayor, so the appraisal, the update to the appraisal is currently underway. So it's in process. Um, and I anticipate that we will have that information prior to issuance of the RFI. 
Thank you. And one more question about that. Then the results of the appraisal, like say it's now instead of $8.09 million, it's now $10 million. Like, will, how will that affect um, what the information is in the report? Is it still going to be giving the land, like selling the land to the uh, developer for $1? See your hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the even if the appraisal comes back and the value is slightly higher, let's say a million more um, than what it currently is, we would still recommend issuing the same structure as far as a potential business deal. The reason for that, again, is we have we have three options. If we don't leverage assets, we can invest in capital, so we can use, you know, debt to invest in, in capital for a conference center, or we could wait to see if, you know, one day the federal government or the provincial government might want to invest into a conference center. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage those assets that are a lot less than 30 to $40 million dollars to make sure or try to create a space that has that value in the community. Thank you, through you, um, your worship. Um, with the partnership with the St. Lawrence College, so I know that the floors for the conference center will be tax exempt. That's what the recommendation is. What I heard is that um, if we use any other floors, like say for the hotel or for the restaurant, as also practice grounds for the St. Lawrence College students, would that make those floors then tax exempt as well? So then the tax exemption of this building will be more than what is proposed, which I think is 500,000 to 600,000 tax exemption. Thank you and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So my understanding is that it's only tax exempt when it's actually operated um, by the institution. We are not suggesting here that this would be uh, a St. Lawrence College restaurant in a St. Lawrence College hotel. We are suggesting that it would be a private restaurant in a private hotel. They would have a partnership with St. Lawrence College to ensure that St. Lawrence College students can actually access those premises and can gain valuable training and learning it within that space. So the difference from, and I, I believe Councillor Sanic, you may be thinking about the original proposal when St. Lawrence College was contemplating having actual, occupying actual space within the center, they're no longer contemplating that. Um, and therefore, there would not be any institutional space within uh, the center and would be therefore taxable. Great. Um, the concern came out through your worship was just that because they would still be like practicing in that private restaurant and hotel um, as part of, you know, like their hospitality program that it would make those, the business, whatever chain of hotel it is, um, tax exempt, but that's good to hear. That's not the cause. Okay, my very last question then is about the um, parking garage. So the reserve fund we know is um, um, $18.6 million, and this parking garage might use up like $6.76 million. Um, I've been hearing some horror stories about parking near KGH, and if we were to, you know, by way of motion, you know, um, direct staff to also look at a parking garage for KGH, um, like could we, could the city survive with a parking reserve fund of $2 million? Because so, it's an opportunity cost. It's an opportunity cost. Okay. I was initially going to say that was way out of the scope of what we're talking about, but I, I think I get what you're saying. You're just talking about the contribution to this. Does it leave space for other... Mm -hmm. Other yes, parking opportunity structures. cost okay. to another parking garage somewhere else in the city. Okay, uh, see you. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So yes, the contribution for this, um, the replacement of parking on this redevelopment, uh, would leave financial room for other types of um, parking infrastructure, if that's something we wish to pursue. But I. I I will strongly advise that council should probably get more information on parking before deciding where they may want and how they may want to invest those dollars. Super, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tanani. 
I, I appreciate the, oh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the creative approach to this. Uh, I like how we're looking at this to not have an impact on our tax base. Um, so you mentioned earlier, um, does this mean that if we get good response and once we proceed with some bids, um, do we, does that mean we have the ability to pick which one we want to, to choose if there's, if there's say like three that are, are, that are interested? then they each pitch us their ideas and then we pick one. Is that how that works? CEO Hurdle. Thank you and um, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So typically what we would do is uh, receive the RFI, uh, review them, identify areas where we might want to further um, advance conversations, and then we would issue an RFP following that. So the RFI is only the first step, and again, it's non-binding, but it's, it's really to get a sense from the market as to what's feasible. And then we can basically write the RFP um, or structure the RFP in such a way that we want to target the probably some of the best elements of the proposals that we have seen. And then the RFP becomes more detail and and we see a lot more of the requirements I think that have been brought forward tonight and that's really one of the critical step. All right, thank you. I also really support um, feeling out what kind of interest there is uh, because I find if we do end up with a conference center I have a feeling that people who come here on business to see how amazing our city is and want to bring their families during a, for a trip maybe if they've never been here, or, and I think there would be a lot of positive impact in the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rich. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, so many of my questions will be asked, so it, but predominantly it concerns about traffic flow, so thank you, Councillor Amos, for that, and Councillor Osinic, you asked a number of questions about parking, which is another one that many constituents raised. Um, uh, so I just have a question about the property tax exemption. So listed in the report, it says that there would be estimated to be approximately $185,000 per year based on the square footage of the, of the space. It doesn't give a timeline for how long that exemption would last. Would that simply just be in, in, in perpetuity? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So we would most likely look at timeframes just like the ones that we tend to apply to other programs like Brownfield. Um, so I, I think we would want to look at a maximum time frame that may be equivalent to five years or something like that. We would, um, obviously we recognize that in some cases or in some communities there are ongoing or there seem to be some ongoing exemption but that's not something that we would propose at this point okay uh and through your worship uh, i think that this is a really interesting proposal i think it's really novel and it does a lot with resources and uh while minimizing the burden on uh the taxpayer which i think is really interesting i think it's kind of an uh, exciting uh, prospect and one that I'm really looking forward to assessing the proposals as we move forward. I'm very much in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Thank you and through you. Uh, well, my colleagues have asked most of the questions I had in mind. I am going to uh, re-emphasize the concern about parking as somebody who uh, sees the impact of that. Um, however, my question has to do with the fact that we are flipping uh, this kind of development on its head, who are we actually anticipating will respond to the RFI and who are we going to be um, targeting this towards? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, I, I think the um, proposals that we might receive would be companies that basically do a bit of what we would see typically a combination of commercial and residential. So I'm not anticipating that we would see businesses come forward that typically only do residential uh, get into this market. Um, I, I do want to point out that we will make 
significant efforts to reach out to markets that are outside of Kingston, which is why we're also working with Enberry Lion because they do have national and international connections in those types of land development markets. So it's something that we would want to make sure that we promote um, in those areas. Thank you very much. And uh, as I've said multiple times around this table, uh, we need information to make good decisions. So thank you. Bring us the information. I think then we'll be able to have a generative discussion about where to go with this. Right now, so much of it is speculation, um, but you know we, we need to know what we're um, going to be considering in, uh, I think, detailed terms if we're going to make that adequate uh, decision for the community. So thank you. Anybody else? Council McLeod, you're all that's standing between us and our 10 minute council break. So I will hand, hand it over okay. to you. Thank you. Um, so first on the $1 possible land grant, I'm okay with that as long as we have the ability to get it back in the event that this were to fail. So one of the concerns that I would have is that we give the money to a private, per sorry, we give this as a capital investment to a private corporation that then goes bankrupt and uses the value of that land to get out of the bankruptcy that they got into. I would suggest that that's an inappropriate use of that one dollar because we're creating equity for this company. So if we are going to give it to them for a dollar, we should be able to make sure that we can get it back. Is it possible to get some sort of land covenant in the event that we give it away for a dollar? Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. We have a standard feature of our employment land sales where each purchaser is required to execute an option to repurchase agreement should they not build within the designated period of time. We could certainly look at doing an option to repurchase agreement for this type of development where in any particular circumstance, whether it's bankruptcy, failure to operate, et cetera, there would be an opportunity for the city to purchase the property back. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I'm in favor of actually giving them the money away because then they would actually pay taxes. If we were to lease this, would they be paying taxes? If like the city owns it and leases it, it would be, would there be property taxes on that? Ms. Morley. Through your worship, um, in, if it's being operated for a commercial purpose, typically under a net lease scenario, they would be paying property taxes. It would be dependent on whether this facility was classified as a municipal capital facility under the Municipal Act, in which case we'd have the opportunity to exempt it from taxes. I see CAO Hurdle has her hand up. Thank you, and uh, through Ms. Mary, the only other thing that I want to add um, is that we're looking at uh, substantial residential development on this property as well so it wouldn't be just a commercial operation it becomes a lot more complicated to lease land where we might have you know condos built on them and, and owned by different individuals so it, it it's a complex structure um, I mean I'm not sure if legally what is you know what are all, all the options are but the more complicated we make it for the private sector the fewer the chances of getting some strong proposals. That's okay. For sure. Um, so I guess the uh, next question that goes with this is um, with regards to the property tax. This was new to, news to me that we can actually exempt properties like you know that haven't um, you can't find the owner and stuff like that. In theory, are we really allowed to like say Vincent's house uh, say give it the tax free status? Like is that within the bounds of council? Ms. Morley. Thank you, and through your worship, you will all be familiar with the concept of bonusing under the Municipal Act, which prohibits the municipality from providing financial assistance to commercial enterprises. However, there are also provisions in the Municipal Act that would allow the municipality to declare a particular facility as a municipal capital facility that provides services and benefits to the municipality as a whole. And when you do that, you have the ability to give certain concessions or exemptions to the commercial enterprise, including property tax exemptions. Okay, so it is only very special ones. I can't do it for my own properties by convincing my No, unfortunately not. Okay, just double checking. Um, uh, the next point, um, when we're approaching people uh, in, in or companies to come and help finance this, uh, it's important that we, that they do more than just talk. It strikes me like, do you want a convention center? Sure. Do you want to pay for it? Mm, maybe not so much. Um, and so if they're not willing to put down money, their own money, I would not take them very seriously. And we heard several 
groups that came today, the DBIA, Tourism Kingston, CAP, uh, Speak Kingston, and the Chamber. Um, we could approach them to see if they are willing to put their money where their mouth is, if they really believe in this. And I would recommend that if they don't, then don't take them too seriously, if that makes sense. Um, because obviously, if uh, the words don't match your actions, you should follow the actions, right? Um, that should be a pretty good indication of feasibility, if money is available and willing to be committed to it. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Ms. Mayor. So, <clears throat> first of all, any companies um, interested in being part of this would have to submit a proposal in writing through an RFI. So it's not just sitting down, having a conversation, saying, I'm interested, uh, can I have the property? So it's a lot more detailed than that, and having to put together you know, a proposal that will respond to a number of criteria that we will include in the RFI. The private company that could become the owner would be expected, obviously, to invest money into this redevelopment. They would actually finance this redevelopment. We would not be financing. They would be paying for all of the construction costs, except for possibly the public parking piece that we could possibly cover. Um, I do want to point out that um, the MAT dollars, so the municipal accommodation tax dollars, which are collected through hotel room stay, um, there's been a commitment to provide up to $110,000 for five years um, to this project should there be a need. So this is to help support some of the expected deficit, operating deficit. So I think that those organizations, being uh, Tourism Kingston and Kingston Accommodation Partners, have already made some commitments uh, to, to this project financially. Great. Uh, the second thing, or I guess the next point, is the, the notion of this report being objective. Um, we live in a, situ in a market situation where a company has to you know, do what they're told if they want to continue to have a contract. So it's easily feasible to see that this is a, a report that gave their employer what they wanted to hear. Um, and one of the things that uh, I noticed a few counselors picked up on is that if you spend money, of course you're going to get some economic benefit. The point is to get the best economic benefit. So everybody, I'm sure most economists know that if you find um, manufacturing for export, you get the biggest multiplier effect. But the second one is housing. A convention center is far down that list. If we're going to spend money to try and develop the, um, the economy, housing is a much more important thing. And I'll give you the reason why. Because it actually increases the disposable income pool of the community permanently. If we have 1,000 people that we can house in this area, and we have 1,000 people that come here temporarily, um, those 1,000 people that we're housing are spending all the time. The people who are coming here spend only when they're here. And if they don't come, then that reduces the amount of money that is actually being spent in the area. This is an indication of how some things are more importantly uh, invested in than others. If we're going to do this convention center, I'm sure it will make uh, some financial benefit to the businesses and uh, to the city. But will it be the best? And I submit to you that a convention center is way down there. We could spend the money. We could just put it in bottles and you know put it down mine shafts. <laughs> and uh, according to Keynes, that would create um, an incentive to go get them. I submit to you that if we're going to do this, an opportunity cost of where we're going to spend that money is probably more important where else we can spend it with a bigger bang for the buck. So no doubt in my mind that if we spend it on this convention center, it will drive a bit of business. A bit of business. But if we were to spend it on housing, we would spend, it would drive a lot more. That's my point. And uh, that's basically it. So thank you. Now we can take our break. Uh, see you, Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So I just want to clarify that the redevelopment proposals that we will be getting back, there will be a clear expectation that housing, residential, be included. Um, and I honestly don't think that anyone would submit a proposal just with a conference center and a hotel. Those are not going to be the money-making um, elements of this proposal. 
the where it's going to get more lucrative is going to be around the residential development. So there will be residential development as part of this uh, proposal. Okay, I promised that we would take a break. We're going to do the vote and then take the break, but just I just need to say a couple things. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I have the chair and recognize you. Thank you. So great comments, great discussion. I think we all agree the value of the conference center. I just I just want to respond to the last comment from Councilor McLaren. You need to take a bigger picture view than just looking at the conference center itself. Because the conference center drives traffic that then in turn supports the hotels, the small businesses, the restaurants, the employment, which then feeds into the housing, which then creates a multiplied economic impact. So I just I just want to make sure that we're clear on this. This is actually a very high value investment into the community, a very targeted investment into the downtown at a time when the downtown is particularly at risk, vibrant, but fragile. And I think we also need to understand that, you know, obviously we're talking about the financial model for this, but what I appreciate is what we're talking about are ways that we can find the public contribution that's required outside of just cash from tap property taxes because we want to reserve those property taxes for housing and some of these other important public benefits. So I just wanted to, to put that on the record. That being said, I appreciate the comments. Look forward to seeing what comes back from the RFI and look really forward to seeing a shovel in the ground on that property next to the Leon Center. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you. I think almost everybody's spoken anyways. So we will call the vote on clause four. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of 12 to one. Okay, it is 9.50. We'll take a 10 minute break and reconvene at 10 o'clock.
All right, folks, it is uh, 10.01. I'm gonna ask if council can, uh, can grab their seats. We will reconvene and uh, look to get through the rest of our agenda before it's too much later. Okay. <laughs> okay, so picking up where we left off, next up we have report number 43 from the Kingston Heritage Properties Committee. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Amos, that report number 43 from the Kingston Heritage Properties Committee be received and adopted. Okay, would anyone like any of these items separated? If not, we will vote on the report as a whole. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, okay, on to report number 44 from the Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee. Moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Amos, that report number 44 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee be received and adopted. Uh, so there are three clauses, updates to public art policy to outline process and guidelines from murals on private property as amended by Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. Um, clause two, appointments to the local music working group. And clause three, appointments to the art and public places working group. Uh, anyone that wants to separate any of those items? If not, we will vote on them as a whole. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Uh, report number 45 from the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that report number 45 from the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's the one clause, 2023 Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee Work Plan. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Informational reports, if you have any questions, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, quarterly report, Kingston Economic Development Corporation, Q1 2023. Uh, Deputy Mayor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, two questions. Uh, the one is about uh, my Main Street funding. What was the criteria for the funding and is there deliver deliverables for the grant? Uh, Ms. Hirschwood. Good evening, Your Worship, and to the Worship. Um, so the deliverables have all been met. Um, the deliverables were in regards to, I'm sorry, I'm not actually the right person to be responding to this, and we can provide through the clerk a more detailed response. But the deliverables were to support adaptation, uh, business adaptation with those grants at a, an amount of $10,000 per business. Can you expand on what business adaptation means? Um, I will actually revert back to my team and through the clerk can provide more details on that program. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is about the airport. Um, I, I was reading your report over and there was no indication of any sort of activity from KEDCO in regards to airline or airport recruitment of any kind. I'm just wondering if you can give a verbal update on where that is at. Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you and, um, and through you, Ms. Mayor. So the um, airport recruitment or business um, attraction is, is really led by uh, the city with the support from Tourism Kingston and KEDCO. Um, in, um, on that front, just a couple of things to uh, make council aware is that there is currently uh, an agreement that has been established between Porter and Air Pass Can, which we have been working with, so Air Pass Can, uh, over the last year. So we are um, going to be continuing conversation. We hope that um, their agreement will be basically implemented in 2024 and that this may open up some opportunities for Kingston. There is also some other work uh, going on between uh, PAL Airline and Air Canada in terms of interline agreement that could help us open the door for this carrier as well. Um, so all of those things are in the works and we'll be reporting back when we do have a bit more information. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll continue on. Number two, quarterly report, Tourism Kingston, Q1 2023. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, I noticed in the report that the American Bus Association trade show in Detroit 
Um, my question is, is tapping, is, is this, are we tapping into the Detroit market, the Michigan market, or the US market? Um, and how many bus tours do we see in a year? And did this trade show add to this, or are we securing the same group? Ms. Not. Thank you for the question, Councillor, and through you. Um, so American Bus Association, we've not traditionally gone to that trade show before. It is um, held in major U.S. markets, so this year it happened to be Detroit. But we thought it would be a good time for Tourism Kingston to be at that particular market because we do, um, as I reported out on our last quarterly report, we hired a new travel trade specialist. And so in that, uh, paired with our city bus initiative strategy, as you'll see on King Street, we have defined bus parking spots now. And we do see uh, major carriers and U.S. drive markets coming into play um, now that sort of COVID has dissipated and we're looking at different drive markets. That being um, into obviously the Detroit sort of um, Niagara Falls market as well as our sort of Rochester, Syracuse, um, Watertown markets. And so we know that that uh, will definitely help in recovery. And so those particular uh, trade shows and events, we probably won't go to annually, but we will go from time to time to see if we can connect with those tour operators. Awesome. So that's, that's great news. Um, my next question is about um, the FAM tour that took place. Uh, how many tour operators attended? And did they... Um, Bring any concerns forward about the existing deep water dock and the proposed deep water dock that is coming. Thanks for your question, Councillor, and through you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, that's a loaded question. So, um, yes, I, I tend to always come to council with major infrastructure issues and wish lists, and I'm sensitive to what we just spoke about <laughs> at great length. But um, I'll I'll put. I'll put the ask on the table, absolutely. Communities with deep water docks are looked at in terms of Great Lakes cruising, we know that. And we know that we have the ability to attract that market should we have an ease of transportation. And the tendering system that we currently use because we don't have a deep water dock is not sustainable. It's not safe, it's not practical, uh, it's not affordable. And so if we wanna be in the market of being able to be receptive to large cruise operators, we do need the ability to create a deep water dock facility that is able to safely bring those ships to shore. So uh, there is what we reference as the coal dock, for example. Um, we have done a lot of hydrological studies. Um, and in those studies, it shows that water depth change from year to year. Um, as well as uh, the choppiness or the, the sort of water um, conditions uh, in those particular open areas that are not as enclosed as they need to be would create, um, you know, the need for breakwater and there just comes a lot of restrictions with it. So um, at present we do the best that we can with the ships that we see coming in in a tendering system, but that's not a sustainable method. Uh, should we want to maintain and increase the amount of cruise ships that are coming across the Great Lakes through Kingston to other destinations? Thank you. And just a quick question, because I just don't know where this is at. We, we are moving forward with a deep water dock, is that correct? Is it in the pipeline? Say your hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Ms. Mayor. So we are currently um, finalizing some um, studies, and it's mostly engineering studies, to understand what the potential is at Five Lower Union, which is what was last directed by Council. As you know, there is a development proposal for Five Lower Union that is independent from the Deepwater Dock, but we have been in uh, discussion with the property owner because obviously they have to be willing um, to have this use on their property. So we are finalizing um, those and we've looked at um, different layouts in terms of um, pedestrian space and so on, circulation. We will be bringing information back to council because we need to understand any kind of financial implications and how that would be financed. Again, we have a lot of projects we want to do and we have to think creatively in terms of how we finance them. Otherwise, we'll have to issue a lot of debt over the next four years or increase taxes substantially, but we're trying to not go in that direction as much as possible. 
I understand. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick note in regards to the uh, the music and the package, uh, the package second sections uh, of the report. It's just great. It's great to see that our, our music artists uh, are being developed and promoted. So well done uh, to, the t to the team. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Shapes. Um, speaking of wish lists, but before we get there, I just want to go a little, carry on a little further from what Councilor, Deputy Mayor uh, Amos was speaking about in regards to cruise ships. Um, there are concerns with the environmental impacts that cruise ships have in, in the waters when they're docked out outside of Kingston. Is it true that if there was a deep water dock, that there would be more controls and positive impacts on the environment? Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I um, have to admit that I was not fully ready to answer details on this file, but here's what I can uh, provide uh, for Council. We know that uh, cruise ships are actually uh, cruising by Kingston, so it's not like they don't exist currently and it's not happening. It's happening. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, looking into, and we actually had a study completed for this, is if we were able to provide electrical connection at this deep water dock, how much, uh, um, um, how much reduction in terms of pollution, air pollution, that we could achieve through this electrical connection. Because right now, these cruise ships are having to run on diesel when they're basically idling. Um, whether they're here or they are in Gananoc Way, we don't have a dome over Kingston, so you know those things do travel. Um, so we are looking at those types of amenities that would help to reduce GHG emissions uh, from those cruise ships. So that will be part of the reporting back that we will bring to council. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I noticed in the quarterly report under the sports and wellness that, uh, and I'll quote, lastly, the Blue Marlins had, uh, had to turn down participants to their swim meet due to lack of space limitation. What were there's those limitations and are there any possible solutions to those limitations? Ms. Not. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, good question, Councillor. Very leading question, indeed. Um, <laughs> I'll start with the first portion of your question. The, uh, the Kingston Blue Marlins is one of three swim clubs in our community. And um, based on the amount of pool space that we have in our community uh, and the amount of user groups that need that pool space, uh, the Marlins, like the other clubs, are handcuffed in terms of what types of events they can host in our community. We know that those are very important events. We'd like to see more of those events. However, our regional type swim meets are sort of the maximum capacity of what we can host currently in our community. Being that the amount of swimmers would probably be capped around 400 plus, and it would probably be a day of swimming. If we had a larger uh, facility, I'm not going to say the amount of meters, but should there be a larger facility within our community, it would obviously offer more opportunity for more swimmers uh, and allow the three swim clubs to be able to be more competitive in the types of events they hold. So larger than regional, probably more provincial, maybe even national. Thank you. So possibly maybe something along maybe 50 meters? Okay. So I, I just... Thank you. I'm just, just taking note of our time that we still have new motions still to come, so more discussion on that. Thank you. Any other questions on the tourism report? Uh, number three, deferral proposed Ontario Land Tribunal settlement in consultation with Friends of Queen Street. No questions? Okay. Uh, right, we have uh, some miscellaneous, no information reports from members of council, miscellaneous business, uh, number one, moved by Councilor Shave, seconded by Councilor Bohm, that is requested by Joseph Dowser, Kingston Area Taxi Commission, City Council hereby proclaim May 5th to May 11th, 2023, is Taxi Operator Awareness Week in the City of Kingston. Number two, moved by Councilor Stevens, seconded by Councilor Ridge, that is requested by Carolyn Schmid, Kingston Health Sciences Centre, City Council proclaim the month of May is Speech and Hearing Month in the City of Kingston. Number three, moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that is requested by Rory Zhu, Fallon Daffa Association. City Council proclaim May 13th, 2023 is Fallon Daffa Day in the city of Kingston. 
Number four, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Osanic. That is requested by Ellen Hose, Lyme, Ontario. City Council proclaimed the month of May to be Lyme Disease Awareness Month in the City of Kingston. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motions. Number one, moved by Deputy Mayor Amos, seconded by Councillor Chinani. Whereas a number of residents have raised concerns in regard to the utility Kingston's fee applicable to the natural gas disconnection, therefore be it resolved that Council direct utilities Kingston staff to undertake a review and assessment of the natural gas bylaw with respect to the issue of expenses incurred to disconnect a natural gas service and to report back to Council within six months. Deputy Mayor, you had the chair. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, I'll be very quick, I'm uh, aware of the time. So uh, right now when someone wants to disconnect their gas, the fee is $2,600, minimum $2,600 plus tax. And then once their, their gas is shut off, they still pay a monthly charge of $2,333 per month, even though they're not using gas anymore. So I would, all I'm asking is for Utilities Kingston to do a review. Um, if we're trying to be a green city and uh, promote that our citizens try and uh, reduce their, their carbon footprint, we're not um, supporting it in some of our bylaws. So I'm just asking for Utilities Kingston to review this bylaw that if someone wants to go completely green and take their, their home off the grid, they shouldn't have to be charged uh, the $2,600 fee for cutting their cap or, or capping their, their gas service and uh, paying the $2,333 per month, even though they have no utilization of gas whatsoever in their home. Um, it's just not promoting uh, our citizens to move in that direction. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor McLaren? May I ask uh, staff? perhaps somebody who worked at a utilities Kingston in the past. Um, why is it that uh, there is that extra charge, that $26 a month, even though they're not getting any gas? Com <laughs> Commissioner Joyce, <laughs> please enlighten us. Well, this is awkward. Um, <laughs> thank you, through you, Your Worship. Uh, so that cost is uh, to cover the assets that are in the ground. Uh, if those assets aren't removed, then there's a requirement for the utility to maintain that asset in the ground. So the fee is to cover that cost of maintenance. So if many people decided to get off the grid and we were to move to re take that off, would that um, affect the integrity of the gas network for the rest of us? So the simple answer would be no, the gas, um, the gas system is a very looped system and it would uh, not have a measurable effect on, on that. The effect it really has is on the rates overall. If people disconnect entirely from the system so that then the, the, uh, that maintenance fee or that flat rate fee is no longer uh, assessed against the owner because the pipe's removed and it's capped out at the road, uh, then, you know, eventually they're, they may have to adjust rates because it's based on recovery and what uh, the income level or profit level um, the utility is looking for. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, do we have an idea of how many uh, citizens are affected by disconnection per year, just to get the scope of the problem? So, uh, Sia Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. I have no idea. I uh, Honestly, this, this is something that should be answered by Utilities Kingston staff. Um, I know they were involved in the crafting of the motion, Okay. but I don't believe that they are currently on, on the meeting, but that's something that they could bring back um, as information to council. Okay, thank you. That's it. Any other discussion? We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, we'll move on to motion number two. I'll ask if the deputy mayor can take the chair and use his discretion whether he wants to read the whole motion or just read the resolve clause or... Uh, it's totally up to you, Deputy Mayor. 
I uh, recognize the chair and will choose to read every line item <laughs> under the therefore be it resolved <laughs> that Kingston support the call of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, for the Government of Ontario to introduce legislation to strengthen municipal codes of conduct and compliance with them in consultation with municipalities. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's more. Oh. That legislation encompassed the AMO's rec recommendations for updating municipal codes of conduct to conduct for workplace safety and harassment. B, creating a flexible administrative penalty regime adapted to the local economic and financial circumstances of municipalities across Ontario and C, increasing training of municipal integrity commissioners to enhance the consistency of investigations and recommendations across the province, and D, allowing municipalities to apply to a member of the judiciary to remove a sitting member and recommend, recommended through the report of a municipal integrity commissioner, and E, prohibit a member to so remove from sitting for election in the term of removal and the subsequent term of office, and... Madam Clerk, all of that? Oh, thank you. That Kingston requests that our Integrity Commissioner be consulted on the development of any regulations related to the proposed legislation and that this motion be circulated to the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable David Lamenti, the Minister of Justice, the Honourable Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Kate Manson-Smith, Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Scott Pierce, Federation of Con Canadian Municipalities and Acting President, and Colin Best, President of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Mr. Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just by way of context, um, there's a, a private member's bill that's before the Ontario legislature, it's Bill 5, that is meant to target an issue um, dealing with harassment, where members of council have, in prior situations, harassed staff. Uh, there's actually a grassroots group that's supporting Bill 5. It's called the Women of Ontario Say No. Uh, particularly responding to an egregious situation by a councillor in the city of Ottawa in the last term uh, that was engaged in some pretty awful harassment behaviour. Here's the crux of the issue. In just about any workplace, in any organisation, in 2023, if you engage in workplace harassment or sexual harassment, you can and probably should lose your, lose your job. That does not happen with municipal councils. Right? There is very limited way to, for a, a city councillor or a mayor to lose their position, uh, even under really, really severe circumstances. So this is really part of a provincial movement right now, asking the province to strengthen codes of conduct to really deal with that harassment issue. It's a big problem. I personally have witnessed in previous council situations where I have seen members of council engage in harassment. And our existing city codes of conduct and our existing rules just are not sufficient to be able to deal with behavior that is very detrimental to city staff and to the organization as a whole. So this is just about adding Kingston's voice to a growing provincial conversation this motion or similar motions are being passed by councils across the province. This came up at the last Ontario Big City Mayor's meeting just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so I committed there that I would bring it to this council and ask for your support so that we can add Kingston's voice to what I think is a really important issue that ultimately we need to make sure gets addressed. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Glenn? Thank you, and through you, Deputy Mayor. No, no questions. I just want to uh, add emphasis to this. So, uh, you know, when Mayor Patterson was getting this prepared, I had already been in conversation with um, a woman who has a colleague who worked at another municipality, 
and experienced harassment from a counselor. Um, I'm not at liberty to name the municipality at this point, but she watched this elected official um, who caused her quite a lot of trauma then turn around and run for office and be reelected and had to see this person's face in public on a regular basis sitting in a seat of power. So this is about uh, us as municipalities recognizing that as elected officials we're leaders and part of leadership is about accepting the accountability for the actions of our peers. So I think we uh, really must move this forward. Um, I'm in complete support of it. So. Uh, I actually went to speak to Mayor Patterson about this, and lo and behold, we were on the same page, um, which was no surprise to me, but uh, a very easy way to, to be able to bring this forward. Uh, so many municipalities are, are finally recognizing the power imbalance that exists, and this is our opportunity to correct it and to accept the responsibility for the things that we do and to show that leadership in our community. So I hope everybody is going to support this. Any other comments? Yep. Councillor Tozo? Th thank you, Deputy Mayor, through you. Um, I, of course, support this. I think that everyone deserves to work in an environment free of harassment, staff, and I know the face of this, the, the staff have received a lot of negative feedback from the public, and I don't think that anybody should work in an unsafe environment. I do have a question, though, about prohibiting a member's staying for office. Based on the experience, and maybe Mayor Patterson can speak to that, I do have con I, I, I'm going to support this, obviously, but is there, do other municipalities have a process in place? Because I do worry about vendettas, for lack of a better term, because that could be used. Like, I, I always worry about process being used unfairly against people. Like, is there an adjudication process? Is there some way of doing this? Um, again, recognizing that this is a great motion, but I always like to make sure that there's a due process and innocence until proven guilty. So, so that's a great question, uh, Councillor Tozo. So the, the short answer is yes. Um, there's been a lot of consultation with the provincial government over the last couple of years on this. And on the one hand, wanting to make sure that we strengthen codes of conduct, but also making sure that there are safeguards in place to make sure it's not used as a weapon, right, against existing uh, members of council, you know, by constituents that just don't like them or don't agree with their policies. So a couple of pieces. Number one, this is about, number one, strengthening codes of conduct that would be administered by integrity commissioners, right? So it would be the integrity commissioner that obviously would still do an investigation. There needs to be evidence. So there's, there's absolutely due process. The issue is that right now, the integrity commissioner cannot impose a penalty of more than, you know, the, the, the maximum penalty is, is a docking of 90 days pay. So that might be sufficient for some circumstances, but when we're talking about harassment or sexual harassment, that's just not, cut, not cutting it. So we're talking about just giving more opportunity for, um, for, for, for more severe penalties, um, but also you know, this would be where it would be a, a judge that could, could ultimately um, uh, impose a penalty. And the, the idea of being prohibited from sitting uh, for election basically gets to the concern that was raised by Councillor Glenn, that you could actually get somebody that could harass a member of staff and still be reelected right right afterwards. And so it's just understanding that there has to be some larger consequence than is in place right now. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Patterson. And yeah, I, yeah then I'm, I fully support this. Um, I, again, I wanna just highlight, I think everyone deserves to work in a safe environment from harassment. And this brings us to where we would be with any other employment or any other employer, really. So yeah, it has my full support. Any other questions, comments? Councillor Shaves. Thank you. Um, I don't support harassment in the workplace. I do believe everyone is entitled to a safe working environment. I have in the past had to represent people which I've had in my office crying due to the harassment that they've been with, uh, objected to. I don't want to see anyone experience that. So I'm in full support of this. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? And carries. I return the chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, 
Councillor Hassan had to uh, to leave early tonight, so I'm going to ask for a volunteer to move a motion to defer motion number three to our next council meeting. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Glenn. So motion to defer to the May 16th council meeting. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, that takes us to the end of new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Uh, if not, uh, Madam Acting Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 13-2023, held Tuesday, April 18th, 2023, and Special Council meeting number 14-2023, held Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Councillor Steven. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, I've been asked to share this uh, with everyone tonight. So living with a communication disorder can impact a person's ability to speak, understand what others are saying, read and write. The month of May is speech and hearing month, an opportunity to raise public awareness about communication health. Kingston is home to many talented speech language pathologists and audiologists who support the communication needs of Kingstonians and advocate for advancing communication health. These professionals can be found working in public health units, hospitals, health teams, school boards, and in private practice. If you would like to learn more about Speech and Hearing Month and the important contributions of speech language pathologists and audiologists, please visit speechandhearing.ca. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, as Kingston City Council's unofficial, but let's be honest, official climate change uh, climate champion, I would just like to remind everyone that it is no mo May. There are still signs available for people to uh, pick up so lawn signs and just help our pollinators and help the environment. Uh, and this is coming from your unofficial, but kind of official climate champion. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Tozo. Anybody else? Okay, Adam, uh, Madam Acting Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Chenani, that bylaws 1 through 13 be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Chenani, that by clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021 41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaw 2 3 readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Chenani, that bylaws 1, 2, 13, and 12 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Bohm, 